So if an individual listening says, hey, how can I take this first diagnostic step mm -hmm. and evaluate my own drive, what, what would you mm -hmm. say to them? The first thing to do is to look inside oneself. Like, how do I feel, right? This is where sometimes I, I talk a lot about a life narrative and, and a person could just start, you can start writing, you can start talking with someone, you can start introspecting that there are ways of taking stock of what is going on inside of me. Am I being kind to myself? Like what's the voice inside of me saying to, to me? Do I feel good about any of this, right? Is any of this what I want? Hey everyone, welcome to The Drive Podcast. I'm your host, Peter Atia. Paul, so great to see you again. Thank uh, you. It's never Thank frequent you. enough. Thank but, you. Uh, I agree. Thank you. So, um, you know, I, I don't know, somehow in the evolution of my thinking on longevity, um, I feel more and more drawn to health span over lifespan. Mm -hmm. uh, and again, not that these are ever mutually exclusive. They're not. And virtually mm -hmm. without exception, anything that's enhancing health span is enhancing lifespan. Right. I think it's just a question of focus. And I think when you focus more of your energy on health span, you're getting a lot of those lifespan benefits for free. Mm -hmm. And you can clearly do a lot of the one-off stuff that is purely lifespan related, like managing your ApoB and cancer mm -hmm. screening and things like that. Mm -hmm. But it's this focus on cognitive health and uh, physical health that get you so much of that lifespan benefit. And of mm -hmm. course, you're enjoying the quality of your life. Um, those two def you know, decline quite predictably. And so really what we're trying to do mm -hmm. as we age is delay the rate of decline. But then there's this third component of mm -hmm. health span, which is emotional health, which is what obviously we're going to speak about in, in great detail. Um, and what I tell people and what I tell myself when I'm feeling a little depressed about aging is that the thing we have going for us is that's the one that doesn't have to get worse with age, mm -hmm. right? Everything right. else gets worse with age. And, you know, again, you can, you can do quite a bit to mitigate that mm -hmm. and reduce the uh, magnitude of the negative mm -hmm. derivative, but you're not making it a positive derivative. Mm -hmm. But this right. doesn't have to be true for emotional health. Right. Um, I want to ask you just to start in your experience working with people. Um, is that what you see? Do you see that people generally become happier, more, um, more satisfied as they age? Do you think that's the exception? Is it the rule? And, and, and I guess as a follow-up to that, how deliberate does one need to be about mm -hmm. emotional health to ensure that you can reap what I just said, which is, hey, you, you could actually be on an increasing curve of emotional mm -hmm. health as you age. Mm -hmm. Sure. I think, unfortunately, emotional health often declines as people get older, and that, that is sort of the rule. But... But it doesn't have to be. Yeah. I think that that can be the exception and, and that emotional health can improve throughout the lifespan. But th there's so many things that we have to be aware of. As you said, does it take intention? Like, yes, we, we have to really think about how are we taking care of ourselves? How is my emotional health setting the climate for my physical health, my cognitive health, uh, for my happiness? And very, very often we kind of get swept up in this idea that, oh, time is passing and we're getting older and isn't that bad? And there's, there's a whole set of societal standards that, that, that bias us away from good emotional health as we get older. And I think this idea that it's so sad that we're getting older and we lament it and we talk about how fast time is going, I think that's really a societal construct. It's a social construct that we can change because if we're actively taking care of ourselves, and this means, yes, it means, of course, taking care of our bodies so that we can remain active. It, it means remaining interested in new things. It means learning. It means keeping an expansive mindset that if we're doing this, we're setting a climate in inside of us that is conducive to all these other good things, to health span, lifespan, cognitive health. But so often we're sort of trying to do that, or we say that we're trying to do that, but we're ignoring the climate that we're living in. And we do have so much more control 
over that. And I think that's part of the message of health span and lifespan is attend to our emotional health, take it very seriously because we're living in it day in, day out. And we've got to step back from our lives often and look at what are we presuming, right? Are we thinking, oh, it's just bad to get older and, you know, the jokes and all the, you know, the, the sort of dialogue within us is negative or can we feel good about getting older, that, that we have achievements under our belt and we have learning and wisdom that we didn't have before and we can continue to stay curious and active and get happier and healthier across the lifespan. There's a demographic of people for whom that's absolutely true and it's wonderful to witness them. They're very, very different than people who are not like that, where you see people aging and they're still like, you know, they're still sort of bright eyed, engaged in the world and that doesn't happen by accident. So... Let's talk about kind of emotional health in the sense of um, how it fits into health span. So when someone asks me to explain what, what the cognitive component of health span is, we can talk about executive function. We can talk about processing speed. We can mm -hmm. talk about recall memory. And, and of course, you can drill down further and further and further into these things. And you can start to paint a pretty comprehensive picture of mm -hmm. what cognitive health is involves. And you can also do that cognizant of the changes that occur. So Arthur Brooks has written quite eloquently about the transition from fluid intelligence to crystallized intelligence. Mm -hmm. And so while, you know, our fluid intelligence peaked when we met each other, right. um, and we've, in that regard only become stupider, we've gained other intelligence, this crystallized right. intelligence that's more experiential and more about pattern recognition. And while we might not have the processing speed we once did, we're intelligent in a different way. Mm -hmm. Same, similarly on the physical side, we have really tangible, and, and I should say one other thing, Paul, we test these things. These are all mm -hmm. testable, right? Mm -hmm. These are quantifiable things. Mm -hmm. And while most people don't necessarily do it, it can be done. We do it with our patients. You go to the physical, it's the same way. Mm -hmm. I can, I could spend the next five hours talking about the nuances of strength, mm -hmm. power, explosiveness, cardiorespiratory efficiency, maximum cardiorespiratory, you know, flexibility, balance, all of those things. And yes, we can measure all of those things effectively right. and we can track progress and things like that. I kind of have a definition for how I think of emotional health, but I would much rather hear yours. How would you explain the umbrella of a person's emotional health? And mm -hmm. then I'll plant the seed, which is where I want to go with that is given that we don't have biomarkers for these things mm -hmm. and necessarily tests that we can do. I want to talk about how we can evaluate it. Sure, sure. Well, I think the way we evaluate it is by looking inside. So, so then what are we looking for inside? We're, we're trying to understand what's going on in us. You know, when we wake up in the morning, how do we feel about ourselves? How do we feel about life? Are, are we low grade afraid? Right? Do we feel on the back foot. You know, th there's so much of this going on in us. And then that impacts our self-talk, which is why we may not have biomarkers, but we can look inside, so to speak, by asking the right questions. Like, what do you say to yourself when you're alone, right? What, what kind of phrases or mantras seem to repeat over and over? Um, do you criticize yourself? Do you have a shadow voice within you that is, that is oppressive or that is regretful or that is ashamed, right? What is going on inside of us is often very opaque to us, even though we're living through that when we then interface with the world. So, this idea that if we inquire, if we become curious about ourselves, we learn so much more about what is going on inside of us and it can guide us towards change. So if a person wakes up and doesn't feel good about waking up or feels afraid or feels ashamed, why is that? Right? What can be done to change that? Because very often the environments inside of us we're not taking good care of. So we, we, for example, harbor traumas within us that we haven't talked about or process. It's, it's one example, or we know that we don't feel great. We don't know quite why. And then we're sort of afraid and confused and we move forward. This idea that we should be as interested at what is going on inside of our minds, what is going on inside of us emotionally, as we are about our bodies, even though we have many more markers, you know, biomarkers, internal and external to look at physically. And sometimes what I'll see is, is a person is paying a lot of attention to that, but 
but it's all kind of couched in an emotional climate that is not good and that at times becomes angry and aggressive. Like I'm going to fight aging and, you know, I'm not going to let this get the best of me. And, and like, that's not a recipe for happiness and health. There's so much acceptance called for. So acceptance of the fact that we're aging. So you're right. When you and I met, we had much greater processing power and like, that's great. We, we could sprint better say, but Life isn't a sprint, right? It was it was fun to be able to sprint when we could sprint really, really well. But I, I hope and believe that we're both smarter now, even though if we stop and look at our processing power, that we can see the change for the negative. But that's one factor that's negative. I mean, overall, I, I think and hope that we're wiser and happier, but we have such a bias in us, a salience bias towards the negative. So we look and say, oh, look, I could do so much more before. I could hold so much more in working memory. I was so much faster. Look, I'm getting old. Okay. The trade-off for that of, of increased intrinsic knowledge, things we know without having to think about it that reside in our unconscious mind, you know, we, we don't value that as much. And I think if we can get over some of the biases that come from outside of us and then come inside of us, both that our emotional health maybe isn't so important or, or that there's something that's not so high yield, uh, paying attention to that, or even that it's weak to pay attention to that, instead of seeing that's undergirding everything else that we're doing on, t- on top of it, let's pay close attention to that. And let's be interested and curious about ourselves because that's where really it leads us is to be curious at what is going on inside of me. How is it affecting me? How are all these things I do you know, from morning till night affecting what's inside and how's what's inside affecting that or things I want to change or do differently. Now we become curious and engaged and we want to learn, which is, which is a characteristic of being younger when people want to learn and think expansively and, you know, are interested in new music and new sights and sounds. And if we can maintain that, that curiosity about ourselves and about the world around us, then we change this really, really big factor that often is working against us. And we're not aware of it by looking at it, we can control it and make it work for us. So where do some of these other things that, uh, you know, that I think of at least, um, and, and certainly others fit into the overall equation. So I'll give you three things that are probably subsets of that. And Mm -hmm. I kind of want to think about how you integrate them. So, so one would be something that's talked about a lot, which is sense of purpose, Mm -hmm. right? And I think there's so much literature on this in as much as there's literature in this field, which is obviously harder to, you know, do this type of work, but you know, you say to a person who's, you know, working hard, but down and out, Hey, look, would your life be better if you won the Powerball today and you never had to work again? And the data are pretty clear that the answer is no, right? Mm -hmm. Like if you didn't have something to do and it doesn't have to be the job, but if you don't have something to do, if you don't have a purpose, it's very difficult to have an emotional keel that's, Mm -hmm. that's, that's, that's adequate. Um, so sense of purpose would be something. Mm -hmm. Another thing um, would be kind of this idea of satisfaction. So kind of achievement following struggle. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. and again, I think anybody listening to us right now can relate to that. A- a- achievement with no struggle mm-hmm. is not particularly satisfying. Mm-hmm. Um, Arthur Brooks again, has talked a lot about this idea that satisfaction is sadly fleeting, mm-hmm. but nevertheless, um, uh, it provides, you know, temporarily, mm-hmm. it temporarily provides, um, a sense of, uh, a, a positive feeling mm-hmm. that is, you know, worth reinforcing. And then obviously what you're, I think, talking a lot about is relationships too. Mm-hmm. So what, what is the nature of our relationship to self? And then the, the, mm-hmm. the quality of our relationships with others, mm-hmm. what else would you add to this? Or would you subtract anything from it? I think the first thing I would do is is take the extremely important things that you just said and and put them under the heading of a generative drive. You know, the, the field of mental health has long understood that we have drives within us and it has been focused on an assertion or an aggression drive, which makes sense. Like we have to do things, right, in order to survive, in order to achieve, in order to move ahead. So there's a, an assertion drive within us and there's also a pleasure. And this must be highly, highly preserved. I mean, mm-hmm. like natural selection must have been ruthlessly s- selecting for this. Mm-hmm. Right. The, th- the thought would be, 
And it would be very, very hard to survive without either one of these, you know, especially in, in an era of human development when one took a significant amount of responsibility for one's own survival, right? That one had to be assertive. You had to want to impose yourself on the world around you. Right? Mm-hmm. So assertion or aggression, whatever we want to call that drive, it's, it's a drive to do in the world. And then there's a pleasure drive, which at times has been misunderstood that oh, it's, it's a drive for hedonism. Yeah. But, but pleasure comes in all sorts of ways. Pleasure comes from being inside out of the rain. Pleasure comes from being warm and not cold. Right? Pleasure comes from having enough to eat. So, so pleasure drives us not just through sex and, and, and satisfactions that, that make it more attention, but through, through relief of pain, through a sense of safety, a sense of security. So we're, we're very, very focused on humans in, in the field of mental health, which is guided much, not all, of course, of our understanding and our beliefs about ourselves. So we see assertion, we see pleasure, but that ignores the humanity inside of us, right? If that were true, how differently would we behave? Like people wouldn't create for the the satisfaction of creating something new, right? Or go somewhere new because we don't know what is there, right? This is humans going deep in the ocean, climbing mountains, going to the moon, right? There's something else going on in us. And that other thing is the generative drive and aspects of philosophy and literature and religious studies and psychological studies point us in this direction. But the field of mental health doesn't acknowledge, right? We, we want to live and create beyond ourselves, right? We, for example, may have children, not just so someone may take care of us later on and we perpetuate our genes, but how about for the joy of seeing the, the children learn and develop and be in the world and see them grow. There are things inside of us that are about creation and are about growth. And when we are in touch with that, when there is an active generative drive, then we are on this path to happiness. This is the way to take care of everything, emotional health, cognitive health, physical health. It it, it all comes together in in some sense, right? It it all naturally comes together if we're approaching life from a healthy place. So to go back to your example of someone who is unhappy, say working, and feels like, oh, I'll be happy if I win the lottery, right? Why does the data show us that that's not true? Because the presumption there is the generative drive isn't satisfied by either scenario. Mm -hmm. So if the person is working and they're not happy, then they're not, there's something there that could be, would be, probably should be different, right? Are they enjoying the work that they're doing? Is this what's really inside of them, what they value? Are they doing it just because they feel it pays them more money and they have to make more money? Do they feel that they need to make more money than they're making and now they're unhappy and disappointed? And there's something in their work that's not honoring this ultimately, I believe, greatest human thing to, to make more than what we are. So the contrast to that is not winning the Powerball. In fact, it's it's the same thing in a, it, coming in a different disguise, right? It is now not honoring the generative drive. There's enough money, but there's nothing coming out of the person that's creative. If someone imagines earning the power, or winning the Powerball, and then maybe they'll go back to school and learn something they really wanted to learn, or they'll go do this thing they really wanted to do, or they'll grow a giant garden, right? If, if having the money that would come from the lottery win and having the time subserves the generative drive, then and that is a good thing. But money alone doesn't provide that. So that's where inquiry could come in. Like, what is going on in this person's life? How are they working? Um, what choices are they making and why? What's inside of them? Do they, do they feel good about what they're doing? Do they want to do something else? We see examples of this so, so often where people are out of accord with themselves and they're unhappy. And then there's a sense of futility about it. I'll get out of this if I win the lottery. And that's not the answer. There are many, many things we can change in our lives. And I mean, you and I know this, how many different things have we each done across the lifespan, some of which we then incorporate going forward and some of which each of us has decided to move away from. And I think some of that is honoring the generative drive of if I'm not feeling a certain way when I'm getting up in the morning, like what is it that I need to do differently to feel that way? Paul, do you believe, I know this is not knowable, but what is your belief around the innate nature of the strength of the generative drive in an individual? So 
if you look at a thousand children that are born across various cultures, socioeconomic status, different races, all any, you t look at all factors mm -hmm. and what, what is your view on the innate strength of that drive? Do, do you believe it's relatively preserved and that early life experiences shape it in, as adults? Well, I think there's nature and nurture aspects uh, that it, it's wide ranging across humans. But if we really step back within a relatively narrow band, but, but if we, when we come in close, we see that the drive varies so much across people. Um, but how we see that is also a factor of what the person has been through, right? Has a person been taught and told that their generative drive was worth something? Did, did their parents delight in things that were of interest to them, right? Did they feel nurtured or did they feel denigrated? Did they feel uh, thought of as less than by the society around them for whatever reasons people do, whether it's race, religion, gender identity, sexual orientation. They're, they're things that, that make people push towards people feeling less than or feeling less capable that the good things in the world aren't out there for them. So one aspect is genetic, that we probably inherit a whole set of factors that we don't understand that lead with a predisposition. Someone may be relatively satisfied um, with a level of life that might make someone else bored and needing something very, very different. But then our life experience, probably through psychological factors, epigenetic factors, even factors of inflammation running around in us and how that makes us feel physically based upon what's going on in us emotionally. Now we have a whole bunch of factors that feed back to the natural genetics and impact where am I at any point in time, which is why we can intervene and we can help people to feel more of a generative drive. If a person feels disillusioned and disheartened, right, that uh, maybe there's some desire in me to do something different or better, but it, but why? It's not going to happen anyway, or I'll, I'll end up feeling disappointed and worse afterwards. Can we help people, can we help people be in the world in a way that better honors what's inside of them and tells them they can understand and harness and, and change their lives in ways that bring them greater happiness? So, I think we all have a generative drive. It varies a lot among humans, but if we really step back and we look, we're probably selected to be within a relatively narrow range. Although as we get closer, that range seems wider and wider. And what we can do is help ourselves to optimize whatever the range of genetic drive is within us because it's not set at a certain place. And through things like giving people opportunity or encouragement when there was none, before, helping people with their mental health or their physical health, helping people with basic needs, basic needs of encouragement that often doesn't happen in, for example, our education systems, then we can help people be at the best place they can be. And I think that's the leader of all else. If we help the generative drive be as best it can be, where we want to be in the world and we want to see and understand and create whatever that may be, whether it's a garden or it's a company or it's a cure for cancer, right? if we help ourselves to live as best we can, then the rest of the aspects of our health will follow. You know, I don't know anyone with a, a, a really strong generative drive who's engaged in the world who isn't also interested in taking care of themselves, right? This, this comes along with feeling that we can be the best we can be in the world around us. I want to ask a question, but what you said, I'm going to come back to, because uh, actually I'll start with my, my question on that. So maybe I'm not understanding it correctly, but sometimes when I think of a strong generative drive, I think of you know, a person who is striving so much, who is so productive in the eyes of the world, right? They're, you know, running three companies, they're, mm -hmm. you know, successful by every metric you would have, but they're actually not taking care of themselves, right? They're right. working so hard that they're not taking care of themselves. That, that seems a little bit at odds with what you just said, mm -hmm. or have I misunderstood generative drive? And I'm now talking about a pathologic state or right. a state that is harmful. Yeah, achievement is not the measure of the generative drive. So there are people who are phenomenally successful in the eyes of the outside world and running three companies and they feel great 
about what they're doing. They have great relationships with people around them. They're thinking as they're doing. They're taking pride in moving forward uh, businesses or ideas in ways that wouldn't be happening without them. And there's an engagement in life and they feel productive, right? They feel worthwhile. They wake up with a good feeling, right? But there are people who look the same from the outside and are driven by shame or fear or previous deprivation, that there can never be enough to, to, so that what you have can't be taken away from you, right? There are people who are laboring under those fears, often from early childhood mm-hmm. experiences. And from the outside, they look very, very uh, productive and, and successful. But on the inside, the things are very threadbare or they're filled with fear, Right. Whereas you can see a person who from the outside world is, you know, not doing very much or coming and going from a routine job, but they're growing a beautiful garden in their backyard and they are filled with the generative drive and they are happy. So what we see from the outside tells us something, but it's just data. It's like any other data, data outside of context Mm. is, is not of value and in fact becomes misleading. And I, and I see this at times in people who are very successful, who don't understand why they are not happy because they are very successful. So it should back map that they must be successful. But what really is going on, they may have a very strong assertion or aggression drive because they're running away from something, their own fears about themselves or shame or prior poverty or whatever it may be. That drive is very, very strong. Their enjoyment, their ability to take pleasure in all of it is very, very low. And then the generative drive inside of them is at a much lower level than it seems to be from the outside. That's very helpful. And it actually, I think, um, probably answers part of my next question, which is, would it be your belief, again, knowing that this is not knowable, that everyone is at least from a nature perspective born with the capacity for enough generative drive to be happy later in life? I think the answer to that is yes. I, I think, as you commented a little while ago, we're selected for that because that is adaptive high levels of generative drive you know, this is the person who in hunter gatherer days would say yeah, the, the food is a little bit sparse you know there's a mountain over there like we don't know what's on the other side of it maybe we should check mm. right or maybe we should do things differently so that we're we're better prepared for what may come next the generative drive and the enthusiasm and the joy inside people when when that is being realized it does pull humanity forward i think it was uh, i think leon trotsky said that the uh, the locomotive of history is war and i, I would beg to differ with trotsky i i think war and um the aggression driven by human envy and destructive capacity is is the opposite. It's not the locomotive of history. It pushes history backwards. And what is actually the locomotive of history is the generative drive within us as human beings and our ability to realize it. This is why people learn and create and imagine like Mendeleev in front of the periodic table and the joy of like putting, wait a second, I see a pattern here and like figuring it all out. Like there, there is a joy in creation, whether it's watching a child or they can be watching something grow or discovering something. This is the locomotive of history, but we pay so little attention to it inside of us. Even, even the idea of valuing ourselves by what we see from the outside, by things that we feel bring us prestige. And we know that that doesn't make happiness. So we've, we've kind of gotten lost a little bit and a little bit away from what our our core humanity is telling us is we want to feel worthwhile and we 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 want to be interested in things around us and we want to be sort of delighted by new knowledge and new experience and when people carry this through the lifespan going back to where we started these are people who are happy and who are taking care of themselves and who age well and who don't fear death Right. That's also another part of it is when when people are, very, are are living through the generative drive, they're taking care of themselves in mind and body and emotion. The, the, I don't find they're afraid of death. I mean, it's not that people want to die, but they want to stay alive because they're healthy and happy. But there's a difference between that kind of enthusiasm and fear. And I think that is remarkable. We should look very closely at who are people who are not fearing death. And, and we see that they are often in very good balance. The generative drive is being honored. 
and the assertion within them and the ability to feel pleasure and satisfaction. These are all well balanced. And then they're in places where they can find some peacefulness and some reflective capacity and some ability to feel contentment and delight in the world around them. I mean, we see this and these are happy people. And we know that is not tied to the things we might think it's, it's tied to like wealth, for example. So how can a person begin that examination? Because I, I think what you said is, is very insightful, which is from the outside, these can be indistinguishable, mm -hmm. right? You, you can, you can have, a, a, you know, an individual who looks like they are doing remarkably well, mm -hmm. um, again, by any metric, I don't just mean financially, but I mean, in terms of actual achievement, mm -hmm. but it could be fueled by fear, by anger, mm -hmm. by insecurity, by any of these other things. And you can have an individual who's achieving the same things or frankly less, um, but it's coming from this generative place. So if an individual listening says, Hey, how can I take this first diagnostic step mm -hmm. and evaluate my own drive? What, what would you mm -hmm. say to them? The first thing to do is to look inside oneself. Like, how do I feel, right? This is where sometimes I, I talk a lot about a life narrative and, and a person can just start, you can start writing, you can start talking with someone, you can start introspecting. There are ways of taking stock of what is going on inside of me. Am I being kind to myself? Like, what's the voice inside of me saying to, to me? Do I feel good about any of this, right? Is any of this what I want. But, but let's stop there for a second, Paul, because that's not an easy question to necessarily answer. I mean, I think I want to dig into right. this because it, it can be very difficult to answer that at a deep level because mm -hmm. sometimes the superficial answer is so obvious, mm -hmm. right? If you have everything, if you have material success, mm -hmm. your knee jerk answer would be, of course, this is what I want. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So how do you, how do you go deeper into that question to, to yeah. what you're talking about, which is the mm -hmm. look inside. Mm -hmm. yeah, then you use more specific tools. So what do you say to yourself when you're alone? Is there something that you say to yourself over and over? If you make a mistake, what do you say to yourself then? Is there an urge in you to be helpful to other people when you see them around you, right? If someone stumbles in front of you, do you, do you, do you feel like you want to move forward to, to help that person, right? The, these are the ways in, these are the, the ways to give us answers about how we feel about ourselves. And, you know, th there was a period of time, uh, seven, eight years ago where I would, for some period, a, a week or so would see people who had very, very high levels of success that from the outside looked as if they, they must be happy, right? Look at all of this, right? And when I would stop doing that, I came back and I would do clinical work on a unit that takes care of people who don't have insurance, uh, many of whom are indigent, not all, uh, who have drug and alcohol problems. So the opposite end of the socioeconomic spectrum, and I, I swear to you that this is true, mm. I could find no difference in overall happiness between the two groups. So someone who looked to have it all would feel, if I don't have that next achievement, it all goes away, right? So the person isn't, er, isn't owning what they have earned for themselves. And this is a theme inside of me. So the person may have made a lot of money and now they don't have to worry about being in need or they may have achieved at their chosen art form, but they're so afraid that if the next thing doesn't go right, it'll all be taken away or they'll feel ashamed of themselves. This goes on a lot in people who are high achieving. It's like, what have I done for myself lately? Right. And if I haven't done something good enough, I can't feel good enough about myself. There is so much of that. Whereas I could see people who from the outside literally had nothing who would be saying, you know, when I get out of here, I'm going to do it differently. Right. I'm going to do it better. I'm, I'm going to go see this person I really miss who is helpful to me. I'm going to get a job. I'm going to keep myself away from what, what got me in here in the first place. And they might have a, an enjoyable story or memory to, to say. I remember one point meeting someone who was living behind a bush under bad conditions, who was far, far happier than the vast majority of people I had seen over the previous several days. And the, the truth is, 
we are often running from something or trying to achieve something that makes us safe in the world. And all of a sudden, we're going to feel better about ourselves. And what we really need to do is honor that we are human. And what is going on inside of us is so important. And if we are willing to look at that, we're willing to ask the questions, what do I say to myself? How do I feel about myself versus other people? Right? Do I feel like a fraud? Am I afraid everything will be taken away from me? Every time I drop something, do I say, what an idiot, you know, inside of myself? Like, what is going on inside of me? Do I feel like I have an openness of spirit to new things or people who are different from me? Like, we can ask ourselves these questions, but we have to stop feeling that what we adorn ourselves with is what brings us happiness. Then we can get to this this owning what is ours. So that person who is going to try and put a roof over their head when they leave, right, can own what's theirs, which is the tenacity to have what survived behind the bush, right, survived and lived in that way and maintained a good spirit. And often these are people who are helpful to other people and have and are looking out for people around them. Like that is something to feel so good about as you strive for what comes next, right? Just as someone who has worked and learned and studied, you know, could feel good about the achievements they have or someone who goes to a difficult job that doesn't provide them with satisfaction that they feel is backbreaking labor and underpaid, but they go and do that and they take home a salary that supports a family and puts a roof over people's heads, feel proud of that. Right? When we don't feel good about ourselves, often we are out of kilter with the generative drive within us. That is absolutely a part of what makes people unhappy. But also coming along with that is not owning what is ours. And how many people who've raised families, right, done things that are so impressive from the outside have told me over the years that, oh, they're not worth anything. They didn't make enough money. They didn't do this. They didn't do that. And it's not what matters right? It is not what matters within us. It is being the best that we can be and honoring the drive inside of us to live and to create. How would you make the case to somebody who's listening to this and says, Paul, I, I get what you're saying, but there's no way that if I had to choose between those two extremes, meaning I live behind a bush, but you know, I have some sort of happiness but I have nothing, no material possessions, right. no status in society versus I could be incredibly successful in the eyes of society and with it have all of the comforts that come from that success, mm -hmm. all of the wealth. But you're, you'll, you'll tell me that I'm unhappy. Um, someone listening to us might not be able to even wrap their head around what you're saying. Mm -hmm. And they would, mm -hmm. and, cause they might be right somewhere in the middle, right? Mm -hmm. They're clearly, right. You know, they're not, they're not, they're not living on the street, um, but they're struggling, right? Mm -hmm. And they're, and they believe that their struggle is because they don't have something greater mm -hmm. or even mm -hmm. they acknowledge it and say, yeah, but if I had to choose between those two, I'd rather have all the comfort of the world, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, materially and be miserable. Mm -hmm. Like what, 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 I mean, it's a silly question, but how would you make the case to them that a, it's not a zero sum game. And that's actually, that's a, that's a false choice. So we'll come back to that. But more importantly, even in that right. extreme choice, why is that not the wise choice? Well, I would say get to know people in both categories better, right? Mm -hmm. If you're, if you're in the middle, because I know what I would choose. I mean, I would absolutely choose that person who doesn't have any material possessions. If I were making the choice for myself, like the selfish choice is to choose that person. I don't, I don't want to be the other person, right? Because I know that's not happy. I, I see where that goes, right? I, I, I see where hmm. the dissatisfaction leads and I don't want that, right? I would much rather have within me the, the, the spirit, right? That, that makes me feel like I can do something, I can make some change because we all need the basic, the basic minimum in, in order to have some safety and satisfaction, like a roof over our head, enough to eat, right? But oftentimes, if you give a person a little bit of help, they can go off and do that, right? If I were that person getting some help so that maybe now I can move my life forward, I would feel an enthusiasm about that. I can make things better. I can have the minimum that I need. And from there, what is it that I choose to build? When we look at measures of satisfaction, 
you know, societies that even today who are by and large hunter gatherer societies or the societies that we from the outside think have nothing are often happier than we are. So like, there's your yeah. proof, right? There is your proof. So, so I think as a society, we, we have so much plenty that we can look after people better. You know, I, I always say we live in a society that runs ahead so quickly that we're always trampling people along the way, right? And one, it's just not right to do. And two, any of us can be in that group of people who has something really difficult happen to them, was up against something really, really big, and then something else really, really big, and and gets to a place where like we need a helping hand up. And and any of us could be that person or someone we love could be that person. And even if that weren't the case, it's just not right. And even if that weren't the case, it's not even economically efficient, right? Like help people to be productive members of society, right? That's important economically. And of course, beyond economics is the human part that matters, but even just the dollars and cents of it tells us help people up when they need help. We can do more for people to give them an opportunity to make a life for themselves that can feel productive and contain happiness within it. And if we do this for all of us, we give all of us an opportunity to have the generative drive within us realized as that may be for us, someone who's, you know, very interested in um, academic learning and success, you know, may, um, may think, look, I, I like that. I like when I get an accolade. I like when I learn something. And then maybe they go off and they start building businesses and they feel great about that. Like, that's wonderful. That is wonderful. If that's what that person feels good about. There are also people who live good, productive lives and they're good neighbors to the people around them. And they take care of, of children. If they've chosen to be responsible for children, this is, these aren't people who should feel any less good about themselves, right? And the irony in the world is that often what I see are both groups of people are not feeling good about themselves. They're not earning what is theirs. The person who went off and studied and created and can't feel good about the wealth they generated that now may be good for people around them. And, but they don't feel good about that. Or the people who, who struggled and worked and, and made good lives for themselves don't feel that they have enough. And I, I see this as coming along with this idea about aging, that, oh, we should feel so bad about getting old and, and oh, we should feel so bad about whatever we can identify in ourselves that isn't what we think it should be if we look from the outside. And there is a real simplicity in just sitting with ourselves and introspecting or sitting with someone that we're talking to or writing with a pen or being in a therapy room of, look, let me think about me. Because the truth is all of us are so different as to be really and truly unique. So if we take ourselves out of how we try and tether ourselves to all the shoulds around us and say, let's talk about your life and let's talk about what your experience of life has been, your experience of being in the world and, and trying to, to have some healthy control over a world that's difficult to control. Let's, let's talk about that. And it's those discussions that lead people to interesting decisions. Sometimes they're decisions to leave a very high paying job for a lower paying job, but then the depression goes away or the substance use goes away. Sometimes it's a decision to strive for more that leads a person ultimately to achieve external measures of success. But we don't know what that is. We don't know what that is. But if we start thinking about it and talking about it, we also go back to the basics of how are you taking care of your body? It's going to, feel, it's going to be very difficult to feel good if one is not taking care of the basics of their physical function. We get down to the first principles, physical health, the things that contribute to lifespan, health span, right? Cognitive health and emotional health. But we have to go back to the first principles of like, who are you? And let's talk about your story, right? Because that understanding is what leads to the next decisions. And the next decisions are not obvious from where we stand now. Paul, do you believe it's, um, or, or how, how, how positive in, in terms of its predictive value would the following be? And again, I'm still thinking through this uh, as, as almost a self audit tool. Mm -hmm. But if, if a person ostensibly recognizes that they are not taking care of their physical health, mm -hmm. okay, they're drinking too much, smoking, using substances in an unhealthy way, 
uh, eating too much, you know, what, pick, not exercising, all of these things. If a person can, can recognize objectively that those things are true, and that's a, that's a generally pretty easy thing mm -hmm. to recognize, what is, the, what is the PPV, the positive predictive value of that sign that says there is something unhealthy going on in me emotionally? So the, the, the recognizing the sign? If, if those signs are present, the, mm -hmm. the sort of physical, mm -hmm. you know, not doing the things to, you know, make yourself mm -hmm. the best version of yourself physically, if, give it, let's assume that that's easy to recognize. How likely is it to then be predictive of the fact that you're emotionally unhealthy? Oh, very, very high, very, very high predictive value because, because think about what's the link between the two? Like it doesn't, it doesn't feel good to get up every day and not feel good, right? It doesn't feel good to know that one is unhealthy and energy levels are low, or it doesn't feel good to look at oneself in the mirror and say, I could, would, should be healthy, right? Or to not be able to keep up with one's kids or whatever it is that goes on inside of us that makes us know that. If that's going on, something isn't aligned well within us, right? Like, what is the reason for that? Oh, I have to work to do this, this, and this, so I don't have time to take care of myself, or I've got to be in this job I hate, or I'm so stressed that I can't. Like, we have all these reasons, but but there aren't good reasons, right? I mean, like, this is what we have. Our bodies and our minds are what we have. So the idea that we can just push that aside and not pay attention to it, like, can't be right, right? It cannot be right, to not pay enough care and attention to everything that we have as we move forward. So the, the key is the curiosity to link the two, right? So there's a high positive predictive value that there is something emotionally then out of balance if we want to look at it that way or something in the mental health realm, whatever it may be. But whether or not good comes of that it is the link of curiosity. I mean, it's amazing, Paul, because it's, that's such a common phenotype among, <laughs> for all of us. Like I don't, I include myself in this category. There are absolutely things that I do for me. It's clearly overindulging in food <laughs> often, mm -hmm. right? Even when I'm saying to myself, Peter, you don't need to be eating this extra helping of dessert or whatever. Um, how do I think about that in a way to not overanalyze this or overinterpret it? Right. I mean, how do you, how do you decide if, you know, my, my overeating is actually a canary in the coal mine that says, Hey, there's something going on inside of you emotionally. And, and, and my wife and I will talk about this all the time. She'll be like, you are really emotionally eating right now. And I think mm -hmm. we talk about that a lot. I think we mm -hmm. understand sort of what that means. She's like, you're so stressed out. Get out of the freaking pantry. Mm -hmm. Like you walk, right. you've been walking back in here every 20 minutes and you're elbow deep in the Pringles. What's right. going on? Right. Um, it, is there pathology there? Is that, is, is that sometimes an okay coping strategy? Like I, I want to be careful not to kind of demonize everything, but right. at the same time, I want to be able to use this as signs. Cause again, mm -hmm. I'm coming back to this idea of man, when it comes to this domain of health, we don't have biomarkers. We don't have scans that mm -hmm. give us answers, blood tests, tests that you mm -hmm. can do with objective measurements. Right. So I, I'm searching for other ways to, to gain an insight into how do I at least uh, start asking questions to get myself help. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, in the, in the scenario you gave where it's a subject of conversation, like, hey, you're doing that, you're, emo you're stressed, you're emotionally eating, then we kind of know there's something there, right? But a lot of times, a place to start is, are we overmanaging ourselves? You know, because mm. every now and then, like, a little bit of indulgence is okay, right? Yeah. So, so let's make sure that we're not, that it's not that that we're criticizing, right? Yeah. That we're actually recognizing something that we don't need a biomarker for, right? If you're like, look... When I am very stressed, I am eating in ways I don't want to be, and it soothes me a little bit at the moment, and then I feel worse about it, and I got to go do something to make up for it. Like, that's not good, right? Like, we, that, that's, that is face validity, right? Like, that's just very clearly not good. So then what we can do and often do is just simply perpetuate that, to recognize that, and it goes no further. Right? And then we continue to do it as opposed to saying, whoa, this is the place for curiosity, right? Like that's interesting, right? 
What is different about the feeling inside of you if you eat because you're hungry or you eat because you're stressed? Can you recognize that difference? Maybe you can if you're paying attention to it. A lot of people can. Mm. And if not, what's the context around it? Like you, you can have an idea of what's going on inside of you and then it fits into this kind of human thing that we do, which is short-term gratification, right? At the expense of something that in the long term is negative, right? This is why when we were back in medical school, no, people were not very interested in studying addiction, right? And the thought was that addiction was separate from other mental health things. And it was, you know, people who were doing something they shouldn't and then weren't able to stop. And it was, it was a very kind of, I thought, denigrating and disinterested um, approach. It is so different now because what I think the field has come to recognize is that these addiction mechanisms, there's, it's going on in all of us all the time, right? The short-term soothing of a little bit of food that isn't healthy for you at the expense of you feeling badly about yourself in the longer term is, is part of that same cycle. It's the same brain machinery that is, that is getting harnessed so that we over prioritize the short term, right? At the expense of the long term while looking away from the fact that we are doing that. And if we become curious, why is it, what, what is, what crests inside of you that you, a person who's very good at looking at the long term and foregoing immediate gratification and all of that, would say, I'm going to sue this right now with food. Right? I mean, if we look at that, the thought would be, we've got to be able to do something about that, right? Like you've done much harder things, right? Than to realize, oh, there's an emotion inside of me. Like, wait, let me go look at what is that? What is that emotion? Where is it coming from? And maybe you can't stop the emotion in the moment, but it might tell you, hey, this thing in my life should be a little bit different, right? Or it might say, hey, I crest like this with relative frequency. Is this okay? Can I take care of myself? Because sometimes it's harder answers too that the answer might be, well, a person should do less, I like that, you know, the answer isn't keep doing everything that you're doing and like don't have these emotions that crest in certain ways. You know, the answer might be, why are you doing all the things that you're doing? And again, I'm not saying this is the case for, for you, but we, but we need to all look at this. Like what is going on inside of me that something is cresting and all of a sudden I prioritize the short term and I don't look at that. And, and this can be the beginning of, this would be the beginning of, you know, 30 sessions of weekly therapy of, with a person of talking about this paradigm within us of well, how are we doing this for all sorts of things in life? What might we be rationalizing about our choices, personal and professional? How are we taking care of ourselves? What's the climate inside of us? Because when a person seems to be taking care of themselves from the outside, and maybe is, right? You can see from the outside, but they're so frustrated on the inside, or they're so afraid, or they're so overly managing themselves to make up for something, then you know, we don't necessarily see that that keeps them healthy, right? There may be a higher inflammatory state that increases risk of cardiovascular disease, for example, or of autoimmune phenomena. Like we know this happens. So we have to be curious about ourselves. And it is amazing what we hide from ourselves. You know, we, we, we go through life hiding so much of what is going on inside of us from ourselves in the service of maintaining some direction we've decided was important, right? I've got to go do that. Or I've got to go achieve that. And then we put these blinders on ourselves and we don't look, is, does this make sense for me? Am I being the best person that I can be? What's the whole set of priorities in my life, personal and professional, self-care about other people that you care about, about a, a achievement. How, am I balancing all of this right? And it's remarkable how little we inquire of ourselves about our own unhappiness or markers of our own unhappiness, even like excessive emotional eating. It might, may not be the determinant of absolute misery for a person, but like there's something going on there that's not happy, that's not in alignment with oneself. I think there, you know, this, there's this continuum from what we just talked about, which is people that are even out from the outside, it's obvious that they're not taking care of themselves. And again, the patterns here are many. It could be just a straight up across the board. I don't sleep well. I don't exercise. I don't eat well. I drink right. to excess. And, right. you know, in those situations, I guess it's, it becomes pretty obvious to someone on the outside. Right. Hey, there's, there's something going on here that you know, you're, 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 you're acting in a manner that is harmful to yourself. Right. Um, we should explore why. 
Um, then you have kind of the intermittent example I talk about, you know, using myself as an example of, Hey, you're, you know, for the most part, you're taking reasonable care of yourself, but then you really have these, these breakout moments where you're soothing something, some stress with, with a, a maladaptive behavior. Right. And then of course you have probably where I think I used to live. And I think there were a lot of people, though not nearly as many who also live here, which is the over management, which mm -hmm. is you're, you're going to be perfect. You're going to be mm -hmm. by any objective measure, you're going to have it perfectly dialed in with respect to your health, right? Mm -hmm. You're, you're going to eat like a robot, exercise like a robot, sleep like right. a robot, et cetera. That's probably a harder one to get people to look inside and see, isn't it? And, mm -hmm. and if you were, if you were talking to somebody like that and, you know, can somebody watching us who might be that person, how would you help them come to realize that while on the surface that looks really good and it mm -hmm. looks like they're doing everything so well that they, they clearly must be doing this from mm -hmm. a place of health. Um, how would you at least challenge the thinking on that? Yeah. One route of approach is, so the, the old sort of Freudian way of seeing this, which is no less valid just because it's, it's old and, <laughs> and the old Freudians didn't get everything right, but boy, they, they really got some things right. And they thought of this as what they thought of as living in the ego. It wasn't the modern idea of ego. It's like, that's a person at their best, right? At their most self-aware. And it's not easy to live in the ego, right? Like we have to think about ourselves in order to be self-aware right? In order to be aware that we're not aware of everything, right? So it's this idea that as best I can, like I understand myself and what's going on inside of me and what my hopes and fears are and what I want and what I have achieved and what I'm afraid of. It's, it's all, it's all within us. And the idea is from there, then we can healthily control our lives, but we're keeping two other aspects of ourselves in balance. And what they thought of as the id was the desire for immediate gratification. I feel bad now, whereas the food, right? Like there's that part of us, right? I want what I want and I want it now, right? There's that part of us on one side and the other side is what they call the super ego, the part that manages us that says, Hey, you want what you want when you want now, but like, that's not okay. Keep yourself in check. Right. And, and there are these parts of us that manage us and that want indulgence and that it's us, the whole us in the middle that has to recognize all that and keep it all in balance. And what we see is that part they call the super ego, the self-management often gets very in the circumstances you're talking about, it gains uh, supremacy over the others. And that's not good. That's mm. how we internalize the persecutor, right? Where there have been times mm. it's, it's a parallel to this, but this is a true story where someone who I haven't seen before, who is in my office and I'm getting to know them. And they're telling me about being really persecuted by someone who says, you can't do anything and you're not worth anything. And they're, they're describing and talking about all of this. And I'm thinking, okay, okay, let's think about where's this person living? How can we get them out of there? And then I learn, oh, that, that, that other person has been dead for seven years. <laughs> right? But the person took into themselves the persecutor, the you're not good enough. Now that can come from outside of us. And that's very striking when it comes from outside of us. And, and it does often, it's not striking and rare, it's striking and relatively frequent. It can also come inside of us. Now there's probably some external modeling, but it can come inside of us where I decide the way I'm going to be good enough is I'm going to berate myself and torment myself until I'm perfect. And, you know, perfect isn't just the enemy of good enough. Perfect is really the enemy of everything that's not misery, right? Because no one is perfect. Mm. Nothing is perfect. And when we're over managing ourselves, that's what we're telling ourselves, right? This super ego part of us, if we want to call it that, is always looking at us. What are you doing wrong? What's not right? What's not good enough? And, and, and that becomes a very harsh, critical voice. And often we don't know that that's inside of us. I tell the story at times of a person who was, who was very underachieving given this person's level of intelligence and, and, you know, other things that they had done. And they were so below in role performance, what one might have expected. And I couldn't understand him. I started asking questions and I'm trying to understand. And then I realized at one point I, that this person loved music, right? So I said, what, what, what music are you listening to? I, I learned the person was taking these long drives to go to some awful job that they didn't have to have. And they weren't listening to music in the car. 
they were or were not were not listening to me. So now we have a clue. Why is that this person loves music as a music aficionado? Why? Because without the music, the person could uninhibited on all that long drive to the job and all the drive back, tell them what garbage they were, what a loser they were. This was going on the whole time. In fact, the person was going to a farther away job than they could have gone to, to have more time to criticize and berate themselves. And it's an extreme circumstance, but but it's not that uncommon that we see things like this. And that person needed to stop that in order to increase role performance, which is vastly higher than it was before. It's remarkably different than it was before. But the search for perfectionism through self-criticism, because when you explore that, the person wasn't aware that they were being sadistic to themselves. No one says that when you say, What's really going on there that actually I'm being sadistic to myself? This is what I need to do. This is, this is how I keep myself moving forward. This is how my, I get myself going to any job, right? No, it's not. No, this is how you're keeping yourself down. But those voices inside of us are very powerful. And yes, I've given a couple really strong examples, but they're not outlying examples where, oh, they're so different from what goes on in us. I think they're examples to elucidate what very often is going on inside of us, where we are trying to manage ourselves, whether we're being perfectionist about it, or we are afraid, or we are ashamed in ways that are very, very harmful to us. Because I think that kind of self-talk destroys motivation, destroys confidence, increases levels of inflammatory markers, right? Increases risk of illness. Like there's so much bad that comes of us, comes of that, but that that's inside of a lot of us. That is inside of a person. Was stops this now person and think, aware of it? Yes. They stop and think like, is that inside of you? It's remarkable how many people stop and think and yeah, I'm in the shower in the morning telling myself of all the things you better not mess up today. Or what did you do wrong yesterday? Or, you know, there's so much. But did did you have to us. prime this particular individual to get them to recognize consciously what they were doing? Oh, sure, because we we had been talking for a while, right? So clearly the person wasn't aware of it, right? We had to, through a process of inquiry, we had to stumble across something that didn't make sense, right? So when I learned, oh, this person loves music, and I just got that in my head, right? That's what this person does. They listen to music when they're home, and, and, and they have this really long drive, and then I learned they're not listening to music, and then it just makes me, then I become curious about that. Now, maybe there was another reason. They like looking out the window. I don't know, but it's like, wait, wait, let's inquire there. So then when I point that out, you're taking a longer drive and not doing something you enjoy in order to punish yourself, well, now we have curiosity about that. How can you not be curious about that if someone you've gone to for help you know, is, is kind of drawing your attention to that? And that's often how we start changing things, even within myself and in my own therapy of realizing there was such a, a negative, critical voice like all the time. And it wasn't needed to help me, you know, move forward with life at some point in time, trying to control things around me and feeling afraid of not being successful or not being good enough, you know, leads me to start managing myself pretty closely. But then I stopped managing myself where like when I was in high school, I could, you know, do three sports over the course of the year and still maintain academics. Like that was good to learn how to do that and balance fun and work, but then it gets to be too much of a good thing. And now I'm going to manage myself by being so critical and telling myself all the things that could go wrong and knowing how I'll feel and making damn sure that nothing is any less than perfect, which of course it is. And now I feel worse about myself. And, you know, that in me, like in many people, was why I could look successful from the outside, but for a long, long time was, you know, really not happy and depressed and ashamed of things and, you know, feeling in ways I had to then through my own work get out of me. And it's, it's, it's experiences like this that helped me you know, have insights. I think, you don't. Know, one doesn't need to go through something to know that others are, but having been through a lot of that, you know, I've learned what you see on the outside doesn't tell you at all what's going on on the inside. Like seeing a beautiful home doesn't tell you what's going on on the inside of it. Who are the people? How are they behaving? Are they healthy? You know, it's not that it's irrelevant that, that there's a beautiful home on the outside, but it's also not irrelevant if Let's say there is a home that doesn't look so good on the outside. There could be so much beauty inside mm -hmm. of it and so much happiness inside of it. And we know those things are true, 
right? I mean, you and I have both been around life enough to know that those things are true. So let's bring that to the forefront. If we know those things are true, let's look inside of us with the same curiosity and not having to hide from ourselves what we might, what we might find there. You know, I wrote a a little bit about this in the book about the discovery of the inner voice. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, in my case, it was so startling. Um, I say startling, not because I had an inner monologue, which I suppose many of us do, but in terms of how aggressive and, Mm -hmm. you know, the Bobby Knight voice, Mm -hmm. um, but it was remarkable to me that it, 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 like, like I just had a breakthrough one day at PCS where all of that came out that that's what was actually happening. And it's, it's a little sad to me to realize that, you know, whatever 47 years of my life went by, probably 45 of them with that voice Mm -hmm. and yet no recognition of it. And Mm -hmm. why that is frightening to me is it tells me there have to be a lot of other people out there with potentially as awful a voice in their head. They might be listening to us now thinking, yeah, that would be awful. And yet they have it and they don't recognize it. Right. If your experience of it normalizes it, and also if you have an emotional investment on some level that this voice is causing you to behave and achieve in ways that let you feel good enough about yourself, and right. even then you don't feel good enough about yourself, so you're really afraid of fearing, feeling worse, right? Then it gains almost a buy, right? Like a buy, we, we don't go and look at that. It just gets a pass. And that happens that happens all the time. It's so automatic within us, just as there are people who say around 20 years of age can, can have schizophrenia that they didn't have before. And they're hearing voices inside of them. And it's only till years later that they realize that's not normal, right? Because they had an experience of, of now hearing voices inside of them and, and they don't know that that's not normal. Like even something that's so, Else, what we would think of it, that's so different than what most people are experiencing. But it's not different from what you're experiencing if you're experiencing it. And it's come about in a way that didn't have a marker that, that told us that it was not healthy. So, so again, we, you know, there's a common theme to what we're talking about, which is introspection, curiosity of like, wow, there could be things going on inside of me that are wildly unhelpful to the things I'm trying to achieve, like being like better health span and lifespan or better emotional health. They're wildly counterproductive and they're just going on on the surface. Like they're hiding, right? There they are waving a flag and I'm not paying any attention to it. So it is curiosity about ourselves. Like how do I work? What is going on inside of me that makes all the difference? And when we, when we start thinking about that, we become aware of it. That's when we can change because you described like kind of feeling all this all at once, right? But that's how change happens in people. Now, I I think the same principles... There's a great Hemingway quote, right? Uh, Which I'm paraphrasing incorrectly, which was change happens incredibly slowly and then very quickly. Right. Right. And and if you think about quantal leaps or, you know, you and I both like mathematics people, like, you know, asymptotic functions, right? Like what we're getting at is is discontinuity, right? That, That even... I think this is true on all levels, you know, down from, from like quantum physics or through to astrophysics, where, you know, you see that we, we are only here because we are in these eddy pools of counter entropy, where instead of everything dividing and dispersing, like it does in the vast majority of the universe, there are these places where, oh, certain forces, you know, go the other way. Now there's, there's not things coming apart, but coming together. And so whether we're looking at the biggest levels or we're looking at the smallest levels, the way that things work inside of us is is that there are processes of of understanding and change that are rare or in in frequent but that we can um we can bring to the surface by looking in the right place. If you look all over the universe, most of what you see is no life. But if you look in the right places where those forces of coming together are more than, than coming apart, then you see, oh, th- there's something that's happening 
there. The same way inside of us, if we're looking where things are happening, then we can gain understandings that happen very, very quickly, just as in mathematical functions or quantal leaps. These things are dis discontinuous. So when you develop, I, I think this will be my, my thought about that. When you have a curiosity about yourself that leads you to now do something where you're thinking about yourself, Right? And you're thinking about yourself with the help of other people outside of you, right? And you've engendered this across time. And now you go do something that's intensive. Then all of a sudden something becomes clear to you and you see, oh, I'm now, I'm now interested in this. And now you start to be, you start to do all the things that you do when you're interested in things like, hmm, why is this here? How is, did this develop? How is this serving me? How might this be working against me? Right. And, and now you can change, right? Now you can change that when before you couldn't change it. Now, yes, change happens slowly, right? It's slow, 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 but then it happens fast. So you do a lot of work on yourself to get to that point where the change can happen, which I think is is true. Again, these are, these are human and maybe th these are principles of existence, right? Same with physical health. This person works out and works out and you don't immediately notice linear change. Yeah. So you have to have, you have to have faith that, that, that the work you're doing is going to get you there. And lo and behold, it does. And that's how these really big things inside of us, what am I saying to myself? Is there a running narrative inside of myself? Is someone else's voice inside of me? These happen to us and it's amazing that we often just don't know it and then isn't it more likely that we're going to choose the short-term soothing you know in the light of that then of course like just get some soothing on board whether it's pringles or it's a drug or it's or it's whatever it may be right we, it, we're more likely to choose short-term soothing because we're afraid and we're out of control and we're berating ourselves it's like whoa whoa let's just bring some peace and understanding to this equation and then things will change for the better even if you have to change things for the better make change yeah I tell, i'll tell you a funny story that happened today and it's it's um these things occur on a daily basis so i get a daily reminder of this um and it amazes me so i was uh, shaving today and then i went to grab a brand new bottle of aftershave so mm -hmm. this nivea big glass bottle mm -hmm. of aftershave same thing i've been using for 25 years and this is the first time this has ever happened, mm -hmm. Paul. I went to grab the bottle and I opened it. And as I was uh, dumping it in my hand, maybe because it's so cold today, uh, it was harder to get out and, mm -hmm. and sort of uh. Uh, somehow the bottle dropped and it landed on the floor and it's a glass bottle mm -hmm. and it shattered. So now you've uh. got glass and aftershave on the floor. And in moments like that, I'm always now paying attention to what, right. Like what's, cause there's no one around for me to talk to. I'm not going to like yell out loud or anything. And the only thought I had was, oh, let's make sure you don't step on the glass. Looks like there's no glass over there. So let's just walk over there. Do you have another bottle? Cause you're not going to want to reach down on the floor and <laughs> mop yeah. some of that up. Cause there's probably glass in it. Okay, found another bottle, away we go. Um, and I remember thinking, at, you know, about a minute later, wow, what a different conversation that would mm -hmm. have been five years ago. Right. I mean, that would have been a three minute internal lashing mm -hmm. of you incompetent, non-attentive mm -hmm. piece of shit. Mm -hmm. What, mm -hmm. how could you possibly drop that? Mm -hmm. You know, you know, and so, but mm -hmm. again, it's, the thing that I gravitate towards is the, the, the ability to start paying attention, to just listen mm -hmm. to that voice. <clears throat> it's, and again, I've talked a lot about the exercise that I mm -hmm. used to do that, which was suggested by Katie um, <clears throat> and, and by another therapist at PCS, which was the recording, mm -hmm. right? So it, for anyone who has not heard that, I think it is worth, even if one person listening mm -hmm. to this has not heard this story, I think it's worth repeating, which is... Um, um, I was, <clears throat> I was instructed as I was leaving PCS to, um, take my phone out every time there was, every time I made a mistake, mm -hmm. um, or k fell short by, by whatever metric and to, um, speak to speak out loud audibly and record the way I would, uh, speak to my best friend if he had made the same mistake. Mm -hmm. 
right? So if my best friend had just dropped the aftershave, I wouldn't yell at him and call him a piece of shit. Mm -hmm. I mm -hmm. would, you know, say, are you, are you okay? Mm -hmm. uh, let, right. make sure, let's make sure you don't, you know, those are really small pieces of glass right. there. Let's not step on them. Um, <clears throat> and while that now is a very easy thing to do, it took months of recording those. And you, you, you know, I still have a number of these recordings, believe it or not, which I would then forward to Katie each time. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, it's, it's amusing to note how strained they were at the beginning as I had to learn a new right. language, right? To, you know, like the, the, <clears throat> well, you know, I hope you're okay. It's okay. You know, it, it, it's just, and now of course it's very natural. Mm -hmm. So again, I, I highlight that to say that was a technique that worked for me incredibly mm -hmm. powerful. Yeah. But most of all, I think the moral of that story is malleable. Mm -hmm. Like, right. You, you know, if when this exercise was suggested to me, I did it because I was at rock bottom. And when you're mm -hmm. at rock bottom, you don't really have a lot of negotiating mm -hmm. power. You can't say that's a dumb idea because it's sort of like, well, how's the current one working out mm -hmm. for you? But I, I don't think I actually expected it to work. Mm -hmm. And if I, if, and I thought if this is ever going to work, it's going to take 40 more years because that's how much we're overwriting. Mm -hmm. Why do you think it took, I mean, I'm not exaggerating, Paul, it took about three months mm -hmm. to totally change. Mm -hmm. How could it have happened so mm -hmm. fast? Mm -hmm. I think three months to totally change, but that's three months of work, right? Yeah, very. And it's, it's that same theory that matter is not evenly distributed, change does not happen in a linear way. You know, okay, it's only three months, but you had to run counter current to patterns of neurotransmission that were inside of you for years and years and years and years. And this is another, I think, big problem with modern mental health is it's packaged to suit insurance paradigms. And, and that's not serving the people it's supposed to serve. So the idea that whatever has gone on, you know, there's 10 sessions of therapy authorized or you know, and progress has to be gained in a short period of time. Let's take an inventory of symptoms and let's throw a medicine at you so now your symptom is a little bit better without ever knowing what's undergirding it. There are things that take time. And when we establish patterns of neurotransmission, it takes time to unestablish them. An example I often give is if, if you and I picked a random word and we said it a thousand times, we're going to be saying it later today, right? If we say it 5,000 times, we're each going to be saying it tomorrow and over the weekend, right? Why? If we know that it's just a silly experiment, why would it stay with us? Because we said it and the brain's mechanisms are designed to hold on to it because we said it. A lot of times that's how it goes the same is true of course with what we're thinking right we're just thinking what we think we put into words it's the same it's thought it's neuronal connections that don't want to go away right because this is how we've developed we've developed to remember things we've developed to not forget things that are important so the brain says you said that word 2,000 times, I'm not just going to forget, forget it because you said it. I mean, you know, it's really yeah. our, us talking to us, but it's, it's the evolutionary mechanisms. So that's been in you for a long, 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 long time. And when you start trying to say something nice, right, there's, a, I mean, you tell me if it's true, there's got to be a fear in you that like everything is going to fall apart. Like here you're doing this wild, yeah. reckless thing, right? That you're Which is going to take your edge away. Right. Because the, the right. Bobby Knight produces great results. Right. Next thing you know, you're going to be lazy and slovenly and not care you're not about anything. not care when you make mistakes. Right. Yeah. But think about, on one hand, how like outrageous that is. Like the thought that you could possibly be like a million miles from that, right? But it's not outrageous to the emotional part of your brain that didn't want to stop it, right? So it takes bravery to stop it. You have to take a chance. And that part of you that says, you're going to fall apart. And you think you feel like a piece of shit now, wait till you stop doing this, right? You have to say, no, I hear the meat and I'm doing something different. It's, it's a, it's, it's a leap of faith in myself and in what I've thought about and learned about myself. Then you can go and do it and you start running counter to those neuronal connections and then it, and then it changes, but it takes time. It takes effort. It takes bravery. It takes faith in self. So when you say, okay, it only took two months, but you worked really, really, really hard. It was, at it was actually it. probably four, oh, sorry, call five, it three to four. Yeah, three yeah, to yeah. four. Okay. So then we're talking about like a hundred days or so, like yeah. really, really 
running against those patterns and making new patterns. And then it feels different. And look, as someone who has known you for over a quarter century and loves you and what, and also was trained as a psychiatrist and was here when you came out with the remains of the bottle, it was not lost on me that you're like, Oh, I, God, I hadn't done that before. And I dropped this bottle and like, you, there was no edge yeah. in you. And it was not lost on me that, wow, that's not how that would have been before. And then I think, right. You're happier. You're healthier, right? This, if we think about health span and lifespan coming from the place that I come from, right? From the mental health side of things and the really is a psych, psychiatry, I think is it's active brain function, you know, emotional states within us. This is how I come at health span and lifespan. I think, right, this is good for you. Then, and I know you're healthier inside, even without, you know, the great, it's great to have biomarkers and all that, but there's not a biomarker for that. Right. But I could see and noted not that long ago, that change in you. And I knew like, you are happier and this is healthy for you. Now, I don't want to make it all rosy, but just to continue on a, on, 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 on using myself as an example and to talk about an area where it's become, it's still very difficult. Mm -hmm. And I've maybe only had a 50% improvement, which again, in magnitude is huge, but given where I was starting, there's still a long way to go. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's sort of like saying, um, you know, if a person loses 50 pounds, is that a lot of, you know, are they necessarily healthy? It depends. If they went from right. 220 to 170, they almost assuredly are. If they went from 400 to 350, right. they probably still have work to go. I'm probably yes. the 400 to 350 uh -huh. guy in this area, uh -huh. which is just general outburst of anger at a situation that almost assuredly warrants anger. So mm -hmm. to be clear, it's something happens that warrants anger, but the response is disproportionate to it. Mm -hmm. And it's counterproductive. So the exercise here was an exercise suggested by Andy White, who, of course, yes. you very graciously introduced me to. And um, he said this is an exercise that he does with um, patients he's working with who are trying to quit smoking. Mm -hmm. So the exercise is about separating, creating a discontinuity between urge and behavior. Mm -hmm. So he says, look, for the first, and I'm probably bastardizing this a little bit, but let's just say for the next month, you know, you're, you're, you, you come in here and you're smoking two packs a day. For the next month, I'm not necessarily gonna reduce the number of cigarettes you smoke, but what I will do is separate the urge from the behavior. Mm -hmm. Every time you have the urge to smoke, I want you to pull out your phone and set an alarm for 40 minutes. Don't smoke now, but when the alarm goes off, go smoke. Hmm. We're going to separate that. So you're not just feeding an urge every mm -hmm. time it comes up, right. you're going to go smoke. And sometimes you might not actually even feel like going for a smoke. Mm -hmm. um, and so what the exercise was for me was the next time, you know, you get some, some, something happens, something that is, you know, something stimulates a response in you that is going to be an outburst of anger. Mm -hmm. And that could be, you know, you're going to fire off a really nasty email to somebody, or you're going to call somebody and tear them apart. Um, pause, set an alarm for an hour and then come back and respond in an hour. And mm -hmm. again, that's much easier to do over email, um, than it is to do sometimes on an interpersonal level. But not surprisingly, when I'm able to do this, and to right. be clear, I'm probably only batting 500, mm -hmm. meaning there's a lot of times I'm failing to do mm -hmm. this and I'm just reacting to situations mm -hmm. in ways that I almost always regret, regret yeah. as opposed to responding to situations. But when I'm able to do the urge right now is to, you know, react, stop, come back, respond. I mean, it's always better. Right. So I guess my question for you here is, why is this, why does this appear to be a harder exercise? Um, and would you modify the exercise in any way to produce even greater efficacy? Or am I just being impatient? And you know, this, this one might take years as opposed to yeah. months. Well, anger is very, very powerful and anger can propel us forward. Like, you know, I always think of like sprinters coming out of the blocks and if they come out too fast, right, then they don't have control and they're just flying headlong until they fly face first, right? And, and that can happen, right? Because they're, they're propelled out, they propel themselves out too strongly. And anger does that inside of us. There's this cascade from what technically is affect to feeling to emotion. And it's worth 
pointing out the difference that affect is aroused in us, meaning it's created in us without choice. So when we have high levels of emotional response, some of it is nature, some of it is nurture, it's cultivated over the years, and, and then these pathways are very strong. So, so something is negative, and there's a high level of aroused negative affect, right? Anger. Right, in this case. And then that propels forward. So, so, so when it comes in us, we don't even know, right? Affect is aroused in us. We're not even aware of it yet, right? It's just a split second. But now when we're aware of it, it has a whole head of steam and it runs through feeling when we relate it to self and emotion when we relate it to others. So I am angry. I am an idiot. Right. Then, man, we went from a lot of aroused anger right through affect to me. Right. And now I'm mad at myself. Right. Or if the target is someone else or something else that has happened to us, then we run right through us. As some as there's a lot of negative affect of anger raised. And of course, like this is what happens to me. We like we like burst right through us. And now we're like, and it's your fault or it's God's fault or it's fate or nothing ever happens right or I'm cursed. And now we relate it to the world around us. And, you know, I view this as the equivalent of the sprinter being, you know, 25 meters from the start of the blocks sprawled face first, you know, on the, on the track. It's like, it's not good. It leads us to unhealthy places. So what you know, Andy White and Katie Powell, they're, they're fabulous therapists. And what they're, so what they're doing is they're saying like, Hey, we've, we've got to, we've got to put a, a hand between the dominoes, right? These dominoes are going, this is running ahead. We got to stop, slow that sprinter down coming out of the blocks so that, so that that person has healthy control over the movement yeah. of their body. They're not just flying ahead. So what they're doing there is they're trying to slow that down and say, you know, affect does not have to run right to feeling when we relate it to self and run right to emotion when we relate it to other. Let's slow that down. And this is a lot of work that we do. You know, we, we do, um, intensive programs with, with people where people come to us and they may spend a week with us or two weeks with us. We do a lot of this work now. And, and a lot of the time the work is around things like this. It's around people like, I, I want to understand myself better. Like I know that this, whatever this may be is, is not good. I want to, I want things to change. And, and a lot of what we're doing in that time are these tr strategies, like you're saying, cause they work and we know why they work. Right. But also there's another aspect of this, and we do this also in the intensive work that we do. And this is the part I'm sort of most interested in, which is in the understanding of it. So, I, so, I, so to me, it then becomes interesting that, that you become very angry. If I, let's say for me, if I become very angry about something like, oh, the flight is delayed, or I rushed to get to the airport and the flight is delayed and I didn't get the text I was supposed to get, right? and you know, whatever it may be, that, that I become angry. Right. And, and, and I'm very curious as why am I angry? Like I, I said, Oh, it, all my flights are always delayed. Like none of this is true actually. Right. I'm like, <laughs> I'm a very fortunate person. I see myself as a very fortunate person. I don't feel that I'm cursed or that bad things only happen to me or that people have it out for me. But in the moment when something triggers anger, that's not how I feel. Right. So the strategies help you slow down, but what are you slowing down to? Right. And it brings me back to, so the slowing down step is necessary, but not sufficient for the real insight. Right. It's, it, it could be sufficient if sometimes just slowing down, it dissipates the energy. Fair point. Right. But we want more than that. Right. Yeah. I mean, that's something, right. But we, how about combining it with understanding, yeah. which, which brings me back to what I believe works for everyone. Like this is a human thing, right. And it crosses cultures, race, religion, socioeconomic status, like we are humans and we have these drives within us. And if we look at, there's a, an assertion drive to be able to have some healthy control in the world. And there's a pleasure drive to feel at least no privation and feel safety, right? And then also to have good things. If we look, we have these drives and there is also a generative drive in us? Are we honoring the generative drive? Are we in balance? Then what comes of that, if we are doing that, is a sense of gratitude and humility. So I think my idea of what's going on inside of you when you're able to stop is that 
that, that you're able in taking stock of self and being reflective to feel whether you see and put words to it, you may or you may not, but, but there's an, there's a knowing inside of you that actually, you know, your assertion drive is, is like, you're doing well with it, right? Like you're, you're, you're putting yourself out there in the world and like, and I'll take stock of myself. Like I'm, I'm not unhappy with how I'm trying to be in the world. Right. And, and I do take some pleasure and satisfaction in what I do and I'm able to provide for people and I feel a sense of wholeness and safety. And, and, and because of that, I can feel good about myself and I'm learning and curious and like, and, and I realize like, wait a second, the, like your life is great, right? There's nothing wrong with your life. And I feel a sense of, of gratitude because so much of that is blessing, right? And also the sense of humility we have when we recognize our own work and effort and we recognize our own responsibility for where we are, but we also recognize that, that it's also a blessing to be able to to bring ourselves to bear in that way, right? This is why people say, I got an award and it was so humbling. You say, why would that, why would that be? Right? It's because the person recognized, yeah, I got that award and like I did those things and I worked hard. And also, isn't it wonderful for people around us to acknowledge me? And isn't it wonderful I've got it in myself to do and I'm, I'm gosh, I'm fortunate enough that I could bring myself to bear so I can both own it and also feel a sense of, of the beyond me that, oh my God, I am so fortunate to be in a place where I can own that I worked hard and got something, you know? And I think this pervades people when those other drives are in balance. So if we go back to what we started at the very beginning, how do people have health span that, that is a wonderful health span to be have, right? And it's combined with lifespan and cognitive health and emotional health the drives inside of people are in balance and you've got to look in yourself in order to get them in balance. We've been talking about that too, right? Then when they're in balance, you orient yourself to that balance and you live much more in an appropriate and active sense of gratitude and humility. And you feel that when things are difficult. Like I think that the work that you've done let you feel a sense of humility, like you are not supposed to be perfect despite all that you have achieved. And isn't it wonderful, all the great things in life, then the glass bottle breaks and you're like, huh, you know, the glass bottle, that, that's it, right? And that's why when I go to the airport later today, if flight's delayed and I'm gonna sleep in the airport or whatever it may be, like that's not gonna feel great, but I am not going to get down on myself or anything else around me, whether it's God or fate or people. You know, it just... It's not right and it's not good for me either. And that's another reason we don't do it. That's why once you start doing it, you make progress, right? And that's why you say you're 50% of the way there. I mean, that's a huge achievement. And what does it tell me? that The next 50% can't be as difficult as the first, right? So you're going to get there. What percentage of people do you think or how often do you encounter this? Maybe as an easier question of an individual who feels frustrated or upset at themselves for the the following paradox right which is on the one hand intellectually they recognize how lucky we are any any person i mean I, you know we talked about this a little bit over dinner last night you know i'm reading this book about the the the, the depression mm -hmm. the the, the right. impacts of the dust, the dust bowl, bowl and the depression yeah. okay so you know this is 90 years ago and the people living in the middle part of the United States were subjected to conditions that I, most of us couldn't survive. I mean, the abject horror of what it meant to live in the depression, in the Dust Bowl, um, and the book I'm reading is called The Worst Hard Time, which is amazing. And so you think about that and you think, God, that was only 90 years ago, right? So just what's the luck that per, you know, allowed me to be born now instead of then? Had I been born a hundred years earlier, I'd be dead. I would have died an awful death in that situation. So I know that in my head, right? And then something happens that upsets me. And again, it almost doesn't matter what it is because you think it pales in comparison to what it would have been like to have born just a hundred years ago. And then that creates tension internally because you think, why can't you just be grateful for the fact that you, you know, you're at the, let's use the airport example, right? Why can't you just be grateful that you can at least get on a plane? Like it's a miracle that we can do this thing. And yeah, so what if it's four hours late, but then you still feel like, but I'm still really upset about it. 
Um, how often is a person coming to you where that's the source of the tension? The difference between the intellectual understanding of what should be gratitude and the emotional feeling that is incongruent with it. A lot. And, um, and if I could comment a little on what you said, see, I think that there's a fallacy there or a problem. I don't know how to, what word to put to it, but something is not real or healthy in the framing, right? I do not believe that you would have just died if you were in the Great Depression, in the Great Dust Bowl. I also don't know that you wouldn't have been happier. Hmm. I, I mean, I don't know that. Yeah, yeah. Right? I mean, it speaks to what you know, we said earlier. Right. I mean, maybe, you know, you would have barely eked out enough food and got some shelter and, and kept your family going and, and in your dirt poor, but everyone stays alive, right? Or maybe not everyone stays alive, but you keep alive who you can keep alive. And you have a sense of wholeness and goodness in yourself, despite the privation, right? We, we, so when we set up, oh, we should feel grateful because then you set up a scenario where like you can't win, right? Because anything you feel bad about, you should feel ashamed about feeling bad about because it's not the Great Depression and the Great Dust Bowl. So what are you complaining about? And then I think you've inadvertently set up a situation where the odds are against you, right? I mean, I'll think this sometimes where up until a couple of generations ago, like probably everyone in my you know, family from all sides extending back generations was a shepherd, right? So you could look and say, wow, Hamptons, look how fortunate I am. I mean, look at the opportunities I have and the places that I've gone and, and like, and I can get into that way of seeing of like, oh, like, oh my gosh, oh, this is, this is so amazing. Right. But then I'm not giving myself room to say, it is not clear that I, maybe I would have been happier being a shepherd. Mm. Like, I don't know. Maybe if you and I were shepherds next to one another, like we'd have helped each other, others flock out. We have a little bit more sheep. Our families are doing okay. We have a lot of leisure time. We think and talk like, who knows? Right. So look, you are you. Yeah. You are not someone else. And you are also you now. And so a lot of people come with the, with what you said. Right? Yeah. And, and what I try and do with all of them is to say, like, this is not a framing that we massage. I think it's a framing that we just throw out. And we say, I, wow. I know nothing about you by, by, by like knowing your reflections on what you think it might be like if you were in the Great Depression. What I know about you, I know from now. This is when you live your life now. And you know what? You're entitled to be angry and frustrated about things sometimes, right? Now, do you want to modulate that and keep it inside and not let it run out of the starting box? Yes. Right. You're entitled to feel, you know, you try to feel bad about things or annoyed about things at times. I mean, th th this is how this goes, right? Just because we are not suffering, we can compare ourselves to people all over the world who are suffering. We're living our lives. If we live them within ourselves and we're the, we are the marker of comparison. Like, how am I taking care of myself now? How am I exercising the, the drives within me now? How am I serving the generative drive within me? That's between you and you right now. And when we bring people back to that, you know, that's when like things can really, really, really start to shift because you, you then maybe stop doing something that like, it's like kind of going to do something and immediately you set the odds against yourself, right? By sort of having this comparison, people will say, well, I'm not, oh gosh, you know, but I'm, I'm not in the war. I'm not in the Ukraine or I'm not in Israel. And I, I know that, right? But that doesn't mean that like you can't suffer now or like you didn't kick. It's, it's true, true and unrelated. Right? Mm -hmm. And the other aspect is that, as I said, like, don't be an isometric exercise, right? Like you might do them, but like, if this is you, don't push against yourself, right? And, and that's often what we're doing. If I want to go this way, can I glide my hands this way? Very often what we do is we have 10 units of resistance and 11 of force, right? And we're doing that within ourselves instead of simplifying. I mean, the rule of all good mental health, which we, I believe, undergirds our health span, lifespan, is simplicity. It doesn't mean it's simple to get to, but it is simplicity. Like it's really, really complicated to start comparing you to the theoretical you 90 years ago. Like I start getting very, very confused, right? But we all do when we do that. And, and again, I'm not, because I do this to myself too, right? When I just stop and think like, look, there's me. I'm here now. I'm, I mean, I know my own history pretty well. I, you know, I, I am capable of introspecting. L let me stop and think, like, what's going on inside of me? What, am I making a decision? Am I, am I upset with myself or someone else? Like, I've got to be able to understand this well enough to simplify it. And if I'm going to beat up on myself and flog myself to get myself somewhere I want to go, that's not how I'm choosing to do it. 
It's just not good. And is that why things seem to maybe take more energy out of me than they should? Like, you know, these are things that you and I both tried to work with over time. Then do I, now am I more easily frustrated, right? And, and I'm not getting enough sleep or I'm not sleeping as well. So now I feel a little bit fatigued. It's harder to take care of myself. There's more inflammatory markers. My body doesn't feel as good. So now I'm even more frustrated with myself. I'm like, what is going on here? Right. We, we just need, we can stop and take stock of things and decide a path forward where we are not working against ourselves and we simplify down to what the real truths are which I'm not saying that's easy. It takes work and it takes reflection and we've got to run counter to some of these established neuronal pathways but isn't that a lot more a lot easier and a lot more likely to be effective if you're living in the here and now with yourself knowing what you know about yourself as you make decisions, whether it's, what am I going to say to myself inside of my head? What am I going to say to someone else? What am I going to do right now? We're intentional right now in that Freudian way, we're living in the ego in that sense of the ego being the whole self. Am I most self-aware? I'm aware. I don't want the super ego telling me I should feel bad about any frustration in me because I'm not a shepherd. I'm like, I'm not having any of that. That's, it doesn't help me. It makes things worse. It's the opposite of simple, right? And, and we can reject having ourselves be out of balance. So just like our drives need to be in balance because then the generative drive is what you know, makes you wake up with a glimmer in your eye, right? But, but we have to be healthy, you know, in mind and body and these other drives, the, the assertion and the pleasure have to serve it. The same way we have to be balanced inside of us. We need some gratification, right? We also need some self-control. How about we have as clear a lens as we can sitting in the middle of it all? And, and another way, I'm using a lot of analogies, but I don't want funhouse mirrors around me when I'm trying to see what's going on, right? I want clarity around me. And a lot of times what we don't realize is we create funhouse mirrors around us and then we get angry with ourselves that we don't understand or that we walk in the wrong direction or that we run into something. And in this analogy is the is the funhouse mirror the construct, the mental construct that adds confusion, such as the example I just gave? Yeah, I think that, yeah, absolutely. A funhouse mirror comes into the room when you start comparing you now to the theoretical you during the Great Depression. Mm -hmm. Now there's a funhouse mirror. The funhouse mirror when I'm mad at myself because something wasn't good enough and I realize that the standard I'm using is actually perfect, right? Bring mm. another mirror in, right? I'm, I'm mad at myself if something good, or, or I'm bring another mirror in if I start speaking to myself through the lens of someone who is so critical to myself, right? Like the, these are all the distractions away from clarity and it is so easy. Like no one else brings the funhouse mirrors in. No one catapults ourselves out of the block so that we fall headlong. It is we who do this to ourselves and we don't have to do this. Just as think about what humans do. Like we create so much and we destroy so much. Isn't that true? The destruction in the world around us, how long it takes even to create one building that gets destroyed, let alone the vast swaths of the earth that we then destroy and the harm that we do to people, right? So just as in the universe around us, there's a, there's a lot more force towards entropy, right? Yep. Than there is to things coming together. That's why these, these small places where like life could be here. You know, this is true in our lives here on earth. It is so much easier to destroy than to create. And if we stop working against ourselves as humanity, right? We're trying to move forward and create, is it 11 units forward, 10 back? Well, maybe we'll get that wrong. It'll be 12 back and 11 forward and we won't survive as a species. We do this as a species and we do this as individuals where we work against ourselves and we don't have to do this, right? We don't have to have needless destruction happen around us. We don't have to have a society of plenty while there are single mothers with children on the streets. Like there is more that we can do, whether it's trying to lift up the people who are, who are on the verge of not surviving, right? Who are living in misery. We can also do it with ourselves. I don't want to cloud my own picture. I don't want to work against myself. And if I see with clarity and I don't bring in the fun house mirrors, life goes a lot better. And I use a lot less time and energy making it go better. And that's true for all of us. It's true on a universe level. It's true on a global level. And it's true within each one of us. How important do you think it is for our emotional health to have um, sort of peace with non-existence? Mm -hmm. Right. I, 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 I do not 
really have a great sense of that. And I don't think many people do. In other words, uh, as is the case in the previous example, uh, there's nobody who intellectually, I mean, no reasonable person intellectually doesn't understand that they will cease to exist at some point. We will all die, uh, notwithstanding all the biohackers out there. But that knowledge, that cortical knowledge is very difficult to process. Mm -hmm. Right. It's very difficult to come to peace with the idea. And let's talk about the best case example, which is you live a long, healthy life. And, you know, in your 90s, you 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 die in your sleep. I mean, it couldn't you couldn't ask for a better existence. And let's also assume that everything up until that point is moving in the right direction. You don't just die in your sleep. You die in your sleep having lived a meaningful life and having had wonderful relationships and having raised children and grandchildren who are wonderful people. Like let's, let's make this the best case scenario. And yet many of us, I think still struggle with the finite nature of our existence. Do you think that coming to some acceptance of that is essential for our emotional health? I do. Yeah. I, I think it's, whether it's essential in everyone, I'm not sure, but I think it's, I think it is very important. And there's so many factors that work against us that, that we can change. So this societal idea that getting old is, is just so, 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 so awful. And death is something to be feared. You know, it's it's not clear that that's true. And when you see when people are much older and are and are closer to death, what they fear is loss of control, not death. Right. So maybe we build up a society that glorifies not being dead, as opposed to glorifying living well. Right. I mean, that would be a nice switch, right? Maybe we think about health span and quality of life instead of living in a society where we're so afraid of death that we just don't want to die and we're not even paying attention to whether we're happy or not right now. So I think we could work against that a lot and we could work against these cognitive tricks, these things we do inside of us that torment ourselves. Like I don't want the voice of someone critical of me living in my head. Okay. I also don't want to be contemplating my own existence, my non-existence. Cause what I do then is contemplate that I'm aware that I don't exist and I'm upset about it. That's not not existing, right? If you don't exist, you're not I know. contemplating Isn't, and, and it. And therein and, lies and, the, to me, that's the, that's the greatest challenge. And, and I, I tell you that I, the people I am most envious of are the religious, right? I, or, or anybody who believes in an afterlife, right? If, if you believe in an afterlife, you have a way to get around that issue. And if you don't believe in an afterlife, then you're stuck with that <laughs> very <laughs> bizarre uh, idea that seems impossible to reconcile. Right. You know, I have thoughts about this and they're, they're not sort of fully formed, but I wonder about that. I, I think a lot of times people ostensibly have faith, but, but aren't behaving that way. Right. I mean, because we are in a society where everyone's fearing death and non-existence, but many, many, many of those people are people with professed religious values. And I think oftentimes we're taught religious values when we're young, or we identify in a certain way, but we don't really, you know, we don't really know like what do those things mean? What do I actually think and feel? And, and I think when people do have a, say a deep faith could be something different. Right. But I think our religious values don't really work against that very much. And, and, you know, it makes me think, I, I, I think it was Spinoza whose definition of faith was like the belief in something that you don't know for sure. Right. And, and it's very interesting when people say they know, like, this is my religious values. I know that's true. I don't think that's faith. Right. And I don't think our, our philosophical mm. and psychological heritage tells us that. I think that's a leap of something because like we don't actually know. Right. So if you think, you know, and you don't have enough understanding or humility to recognize that there is a leap of faith, then are you doing something that doesn't actually help you? And this isn't me being anti-religious. I mean, I think faith is very, very important, but it's recognized and such. There is something I believe, but I do not know that. 
thing. I believe it. Now, that's very interesting. Why does the person believe it? How do we see the beyond ourselves as opposed to just pasting something on that doesn't actually make change? Because I, I think what I think I'm trying to say is when, when people feel very, very sure of something, then it makes me, I, I worry about that. And when people feel very, very sure that there's nothing, I also worry about that. If you think about it, I find it quite amazing that there are so many things that we know a little bit about that that fills me with wonderment about what else might be there. If you, you think about things yeah. happen outside of time and space, that's interesting, right? There have been experiments done where you or I could decide what happened in the past, not figure out what happened, but decide, right? So time, space, movement, the impact of consciousness upon the world around us. This is all so interesting. Even the things we learn about that are going on inside of our brains, you know, the, the, the cutting edge of neurobiology and neuroimaging and some of the psychedelic studies and what they've shown going on inside of us tells me, I don't know what happens next. I don't know that. And I may have all sorts of thoughts one way or another. And maybe some of it comes from early education and some of it comes from the faith I was raised in, but, but like, I don't know, right? And, and that not knowing, I find to be very, very hopeful, right? I don't know what comes next. It doesn't mean that I'm going to rely on anything in particular, but it certainly means I'm not going to despair about non-existence. I'm not sure of that, right? And I think that's what it tells us. I think that's what Spinoza was writing about. And I think what great religious thinkers, not that I've read a lot of them, but when they're, they're, they're writing within religions, they're writing in these ways too. And Maybe that engenders a respectfulness. I think if we knew that there was nothing afterwards, I would hope we could still find a way to be respectful of our lives. But the fact that we don't know what comes next is interesting. And I think to me, that's full of interest and curiosity and hope. Like the generative drive in me gets activated mm. when I think about dying. Why? Right? Now it doesn't all the time, mm. right? I can feel afraid. I can feel, but, but it can get active. I think, I don't know what comes next. And, and I think that's interesting. And, you know, things happen outside of space and time. They're certainly not absolute. And our consciousness may, you know, actually change things, be its own entity in the world around us. And we all have different times. And do we have different dimensions? Like this is out there in the world around us. This is out there. This isn't pie in the sky. Like this is academic studies, right? That are telling us these things. When I think about that and scratch the surface a little bit, I go, huh, I don't know. Okay. That's interesting. And I think it helps me to feel a sense of real interest and excitement about then living the best life that I can live. Because if it's all I have, then oh, I really, I want it to be good. I want it to be the best it can be for me and the people around me. But in taking care of myself, I'm better for other people, right? I, say, I feel invigorated by that, not afraid. And, and I think, again, you see that in people uh, who don't fear death. They're happy with their life they're leading life in a way that they can feel a sense of pride and they feel humble. They feel gratitude. They're rooted in that. And there's often a sense of not always, but there's often a sense of, I don't know. And isn't that okay? Like think about how many things we don't know, right? Can we take care of ourselves and treat every life as precious? This idea that there's nothing special about any of us, but there's something special about each one of us. And I think not knowing what comes next and the idea that if we think there is something or isn't, that there's faith involved, that, 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 that's a thought process. That's a deciding on the part of the person that comes through interest. I think that engenders us to, to be better to ourselves and better to other people. And I think then we stop fearing death and we stop living in this kind of pseudo cult of like, I must not die, which is fed by all these fantasies and these places we can get us. Even in literature, I think about like No Exit, a, a great play by Sartre where, where like people are dead and they're watching themselves, right? You know, that's interesting as a way of like learning something through the fantasy of literature, right? But there's a theme that runs through that, that we're dead and we see ourselves with despair, mm -hmm. right? And I feel pretty sure that's not happening. It would really make no sense that that happens, right? That there's some punishment of seeing ourselves with despair. Like, why would it be? They just can't be that. And I think if we're open to that, we just don't know. And the literature and the philosophy and the world around us, it is interesting things to say, but no one's going to tell us. Like, isn't that awesome? I think it is.
Paul, I want to talk a little bit about um, how a person can find a therapist that's going to help them be a guide through a lot of the stuff we've been talking about today. So, you know, there are a few facts that people I think are generally starting to understand, which is of all branches of medicine, um, this is one in which the interpersonal relationship between the doctor and the patient, and we'll broaden it because it's not just about physician patient, but the therapist and the patient, the interpersonal connection matters more than it matters in any other form of care between a provider and yes. a patient. So it's great if you love your dentist, it's great if you, you know, have a connection to your surgeon, it turns out to not matter nearly as much. Would you agree with that statement? Yeah, and and I, think, like, I don't want to use like as the word, but what I, I what, what word would you use for what I'm trying to say? Rapport. I mean, there've been okay. so many studies that show how important rapport is. And yes, it is good to have rapport with one surgeon, but it's not the primary factor, presumably. Yeah. Right. So rapport is very, very, very important. And, and one might argue indis indispensable. And that's why you see studies that people can come at things from different perspectives. Like you think about the anger part. Like, okay. So how... Andy or Katie may come at it is, hey, let's talk about getting a, a, a space between the anger and the response. Okay, now they also want you to understand it too, yeah. right? I might come really from like the understanding. So you go to a place of humility and gratitude, but I want you to pause too, right? I mean, we're not doing different things, but we're doing what we're doing from very different perspectives that will feel very different if you're on the receiving end of it, right? And that's why when people say, well, if rapport matters and does it matter, then maybe it doesn't matter what those people are doing, right? But that's not true. Like the, the, the presumption is the therapist knows what they're doing. They're yep. coming at the, the skilled part of it from different perspectives, but it doesn't matter that the therapist knows what they're doing if there isn't rapport, right? So let's take that as a necessary but not sufficient piece of the equation. Mm -hmm. What are other things that a person should be asking themselves? And we can handle the following questions separately, but I want to address both. A, scenario one, you are going to seek the help of a therapist for the first time. Mm -hmm. And B, you have been working with a therapist for a long period of time and you want to evaluate if this is productive. Mm -hmm. And the impetus for B is, I can't tell you how many people I've met in my life who even to my completely untrained eye, which tends to be more critical of self than others, I look at them and I think, what is your therapist getting paid for? Mm -hmm. Like, mm -hmm. you, you were, you were having the exact same problems today that you had five years ago. If anything, you seem a bit worse. And yet you tell me you're seeing somebody every week. Mm -hmm. And again, I don't say that to be judgmental. I say that from a place of, I want you to be better. Um, and maybe somebody listening to this identifies with that. Mm -hmm. But so, so anyway, again, feel free to tackle those separately. But what I want to understand are, what are the questions a person should be asking themselves of the therapist um, and per perhaps of themselves in those two situations to make the best choice. A, how do I find someone de novo to start? And B, how do I decide mm -hmm. if I need somebody new? There's a lot of specifics I could say about those things and, and maybe we'll talk about let's, the specifics. Yeah, I wanna hear but, those. But I think I would start them in a different place. Okay. I, I would start with an overarching principle because I think the principle always applies and then it can get at a lot of these things underneath the principle right so i would ask does one plus one equal more than two okay so the way that mental health was thought about um say before the end of the second world war it can our minds were conceived of as very transactional so they would say, like, even now, like, I put something out there in words, you take it in, then you put it into your brain, you put something out in words, I take it in, right? So there's, a, there's even though they would acknowledge we're doing something, the thought was it's very, very transactional, right? And what we see is that's not really the truth. And I think Viktor Frankl's writings after the Second World War um, were really an, an impetus to really see this and, and led to a, a whole different um 
type of psychotherapy that was called existential psychotherapy. It still is existential psychotherapy, and it doesn't map to the existential philosophers exactly, but there, there are principles there that are around shared humanness. So do you feel like one plus one is more than two? When you're, when you're with the person, you're going to have thoughts and feelings and ideas, and, and that person's going to have thoughts and feelings and ideas too. And, and does that create something more between the two of you? Right? And the thought is, this is how we find meaning in life, that when we're with someone we love, for example, it's not just it is us and it is them. There is an us. Right? Like you're you, the other person is who he or she is, but together there's something different that, that each isn't going to find on their own, right? And that each isn't going to find with another person. The, in this case, the dyad is special. The two people together are more than the sum of each of them. And I think that's true for satisfaction, enjoyment, learning in, in human relationships. And, and I think because these principles run wide, right? So the same thing that would apply, applies here too, right? That, that there should be someone whose presence and whose work with you, like there's a shared humanness and you're figuring things out and you feel the greater than two, of the two people in the room. And I think that's a lot of what rapport is. I mean, some of what rapport is is positive self-regard, or or, sorry, sorry, positive regard of the the other, Mm -hmm. right? And and there are pleasantries and nicer ways we can build rapport, but I think they're more on the surface, right? They're important, but that's not what makes real rapport when someone is helped. I think what makes real rapport is the fact that here I am with you, and there's something different with us then then there isn't just the sum of us like something new and different Mm. is here and i feel that when i come in the room to see you right and i think you feel it too when i come in it's it's a real interest in me and a real like applying of one's brain to the other and you know whether we call that rapport or you know i just feel great about that person or man it's so dynamic like there is something there that is the therapist really being present And, and i think that that's an obligation of the therapist. We're supposed to know technical things. And of course, like there are things that we have to learn, but we're supposed to give of ourselves in a way that has us truly be present with the person. Like if you fit, if you figure that out, whoever the person is, right. Thinking, should I take this there? Should I have this person be my therapist or should I leave this therapist and try something new? I mean, if you try that on for size and it doesn't fit, you should probably change something. How long in the um, context of the first scenario, which is somebody looking for a therapist, how many meetings with a person do you think you need to have before you can evaluate that? You know, I always say this, I talk about this a, a lot. It, you can know if things really aren't right. You know, if a person is approaching the therapy process and they really want to be there and all of that, you know, sometimes you can just tell if you're not going to resonate with someone like look, someone who's not making eye contact, for example, like, Hey, you can tell, or, you know, you, you just feel an awkward sense. Like sometimes this happens with, with people. And sometimes you can know that, okay, that's not going to be right. But again, be fair and reasonable about it. Say, are, are you, do you really want to be in therapy? Right. Cause, cause if, if you don't, then maybe you're going to find something wrong with everyone. Right. But if you, if you really bring yourself to the process, then I say you can tell no a, sooner than you can tell yes. Right? Because in the first couple of sessions, what's going on is you're trying to build a relationship and people need to get to know one another a little bit and how they respond and what their mannerisms are and if they have a sense of humor and you know how much emotional valence is inside of them. And it takes time. So there's a little bit of a dance like there is in any, you know, in any new human relationship. So the thought is if something really rubs you the wrong way and you're, you're looking at that honestly, you could probably tell no first, second, third, you know, along the line. If not, give it a little bit of time, you know, five, six, seven, to, to see, do I feel like I'm resonating with this person? Are we really getting somewhere? Because again, the progress and the perception of progress is not linear, Yeah. right? And sometimes a person, oh, four sessions, I'm not so sure. Okay, so I'm not so sure. Let's give it a couple more because sometimes by the six, the person feels like it's kind of falling flat and I don't feel that there's one plus one is not equaling more than two. Or sometimes, you know, the stuff we did early on is kind of clicking a little bit and now it's only session six, it's two more than four, but they start really feeling something. So, you know, there's a process to that, but but if one just applies those principles, then again, I think it's also, there's a process to it, but it's also a process that you can really apply of, I'm looking for things that are real negatives. Like that person isn't making eye contact, that's bad, right? Okay, like, or, or I really feel at odds. Like you can feel it, acknowledge it, right? If you don't, 
be observant, be patient. You know, what's going on inside of you? How are you feeling? Are you feeling helped? Do you feel a, a, what gets called a holding environment that, that the space when you go in is a safe space, right? And you can be open and honest because so many times people fear criticism where they feel that they'll say something. This is often true with trauma. They'll divulge something and then the other person will recoil in, in horror, right? And this happens a lot where someone will just talk about you know the the worst the thing imaginable right? yeah. they talk about and, and they're saying it and and you'll see this is kind of known in therapy education but if you do therapy long, if you see this in people like they're surprised oh my god like I, I said that right and then they're surprised that that the other person that i didn't recoil from them because inside of themselves they've held that this is something shameful and someone else should recoil right because they're carrying shame from it right but if you develop enough of a holding environment, enough benign regard, enough real humanness with the person, then that can come out of them without them having even decided. It just naturally flows out because they know that they're in a safe place and somewhere inside of them, they know that other person isn't going to recoil. Just like they wouldn't recoil. Just like you're saying, what would you say to your best friend, right? Right. So somewhere inside of you, you know that you you don't really want to be saying the things you're saying to yourself, right? You kind of know that because why would you say it to yourself and not someone else, right? But but that's different than having an experience of it, right? right? And having an experience, in your case, when you were making the recordings, you're having an experience of a more accepting self. That's great, right? We can also have that experience with an other who represents a more accepting self. If the other person doesn't recoil, that's right. You don't, you're not really recoiling from that either. No, I mean, I think that's such an interesting example because I really felt uncomfortable sending those recordings to Katie. And I think initially I said, well, I'm uncomfortable because I hate that I'm wasting her time. Like, you know, I'm right. lighting up her phone with text messages of these recordings, right. but that's actually probably less what it was. I think it was more, right. I'm ashamed of the fact that I'm doing this and I'm ashamed of how difficult this is. And, you know, what is she thinking when she gets this? Like, again, this is a narrative you're making that's incorrect if a good right. therapist isn't none of those things right. are true right but that's but that's the thought you're having right right so you have to know that she really wants you to send them right yes. that she really wants you to send them and she really wants to help you and she really feels good about you she sees the goodness in you right and then it lets you do something that exposes the shame right I think you tell me, part of what you feel ashamed of is that you're doing that to yourself, right? So, but you know, shame isn't always bad. Yeah, no, the shame is that this is, this is so hard to do. This shouldn't be hard to do. And I shouldn't, yeah, it's, I shouldn't be doing this to myself. And therefore this exercise, A, shouldn't be necessary and B, it should be a piece of cake and it's not. So now it's witness because think about this competing shames, right? Yeah. So on the one end, the shame from, of not being perfect, mm. right, leads you to do something shameful to yourself, which is to be berating yourself. Look, if you if you did that to someone else, we would say, hey, that's a good reason to feel ashamed, right? To, to talk to somebody like that just because they broke something. We say, hey, that's not okay. So why is it that you shouldn't feel ashamed when you're saying it to yourself, right? Shame can help us by changing behaviors, right? But now you have like competing shame. Should you be ashamed that you're not perfect? And it's good that you're beating up on yourself. Should you be ashamed that you're beating up on yourself? Because it's okay that you're not perfect, right? Like this is part of what keeps us in stasis, right? But then she, as the person, she, she's not completely separate from you in that way. Like one plus one isn't equaling more than two now because she becomes a little bit of an arbiter or a metric of like what really makes sense here and her reflecting back to you that, hey, you're, you're worth treating better than, you're worth treating better than this, right? And yeah, this is not okay for anyone, including you. Like, you know, it's, it's not okay. You're not the only person who gets to be beaten up this way. Then part of that is her seeing that lets it help makes it easier for you to change because then you put the shame in the right place. Like, right. If I feel ashamed that I'm doing this to myself, I want to stop. And if it's going to take a long time, I'm going to let it take a long time. I'm not going to be so ashamed. It's still here in three weeks that I stop, right? I'm going to keep doing it. But part of what lets you do that, it's the exposure to the outside person who you trust because then that person becomes a barometer of what's real and true here. And then it helps us get our own minds into place. Like, oh, right, right. Okay. I do get this, right? It is okay that I am not perfect. I do not want to beat up on anyone like this, including myself. Like now you've got the resolve inside of you to do it. Why? Because you've been validated. Whereas before, you might not have been so sure if the shame is with the lack of perfection or with the self-talk. Let's now talk about kind of um, a, a, sort of a, another question around the person who's been in therapy 
they have the therapist. Um, how often do you see a therapist whose rapport is in the way that they think of rapport, which is getting along, but they're not hitting the one plus one is greater than two. Right. Um, cause again, that's can, that can be difficult to quantify, but, but the rapport is such that it's almost enabling the behavior in the client or the patient. Right. And th there's, there's no progress being made. And in part it's be, and, and yet the, the, the client feels like, Hey, this is great. I have a therapist. I love my therapist. I see my therapist right. all the time. I go in there once a week and tell them everything that's wrong. And it feels really great to do that. But if you, if, if an objective person, if you were sitting there looking at this, you'd say, yeah, but things aren't getting better. Right. Right. Like, so, you know, is there value in just having a person that you pay to listen to what's wrong right. or are you paying this person to help you become better at dealing with whatever it is that's going wrong, which might indirectly result in less frequency of these right. things happening. So, yeah, I don't know, my question, I'm fumbling through it a little bit, but I think I know what you, what, what, what I'm asking. Mm -hmm. Um, so, so, Question one is the first critical step in that, that the person themselves must recognize that I need to reevaluate this relationship. And, and if so, then what are the tools to evaluate that? Well, I think unfortunately, yes, in the example that you gave, because it shouldn't have to come to that. You know, I mean, therapists are people and we know that whatever occupation you, you take, there's a significant subset of people who aren't giving it their best. I mean, that's part of humanity too. Um, so the therapist is, is really transgressing something there that should not be transgressed. Um, and you see this, right? I'm not just making oh, this sure, scenario this happens, up. Sure, it happens a lot because again, it's, you know, it's, it's not everybody brings their best to their work, right? And for some therapists, it's okay. They'll, they'll let the person come and go and they, they kind of rationalize, well, they're kind of still clicking along and, you know, they're doing okay in this way or that way. And, and they'll rationalize that what they're doing is a non-doing. They're not actually doing anything. And the obligation for the therapist is to know, I know this person is benefiting from this. I see where we're going. So even if I don't see it now, I might see there's, I don't think there's going to be any change for the better in six to nine months. Okay. I have to accept that from week to week because I know where we're going to get to if we do the work by the 10th month. I mean, it's just a more complicated situation, but the therapist has to know we're either achieving something now or we're heading towards achieving something that's changing this person. It's my job to be active about that. And it's my job to not get complacent. Or if I see that person wants to get complacent, to, to, to talk about that with them. It's just a harder job, right? But I think it's the therapist's obligation to do the job that way. Now, when that doesn't happen, then we end up in the situation you're in. You're describing, sorry, you're, not, you're describing, right? We're saying, hey, this person is in this situation where things aren't getting better. And I think putting a full stop to that, like, what am I doing here? What am I paying for? Right. And sometimes that's a good question. You know, what are you paying for? You go buy a gallon of milk. You know, you're paying for a gallon of milk. You go for an hour of therapy. It, what are you, are you going for an hour of, I want to understand myself and make change. Are you going for, it's an hour. I talk about all the things that are making me angry the last week. And then that person gives me a little bit of sympathy and I'm no less angry, Right. you know, to, to really look inside at, at what the person is serving and also how good does it feel? How comfortable does it feel? It shouldn't always feel good and comfortable, right? There should be times when you're talking about something that's not easy to talk about, or you know, you're crying in therapy, you're upset in therapy. Like it's supposed to be work, right? It doesn't mean it has to be work every moment. Although I mean, there's there's a lot of fun to it too, and I mean, I have great fun doing therapy, whether I'm the one doing it with someone else or I'm having doing therapy with Gregory Hamilton, who's been my therapist for gosh, 13 years or so now. Like, it's fun a lot too, but sometimes I'm upset or I'm crying or he says something to me or I say something to someone that's like, whoa, that's okay. I've got to take that in. Like it's, you know, it's supposed to be work that everything in life is that way too. So if it's too easy, that's not a good sign. If you feel sort of a threadbare, that's a kind of, you said it's hard to quantify when one plus one is greater than two, but you do kind of know it often in human relationships. You just feel good with someone. There's, there's something where you're more than the two of you. That's why people want to spend time together. It's why people become romantically interested in one another. It's, there's a lot of that going on in, in aspects of human relationships. Uh, let's dig into that a little bit more. Cause it really is, I've never contemplated that at all. But, um, as you pointed out, you take two people like you and I, who are very close friends, um, the, it's such a clear example of that, right? Um, 
the, 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 yes, the sort absolutely. of the accretive nature yes. of the interaction. But we are friends. Right. And yet we don't necessarily feel that a therapist and patient should be friends. Right. So what are the other, what, what, are, what are some other questions a person can ask to try to get at that, uh, that, that accretive nature of coexistence? Right. Well, so yet I'd go back to the framing of it. So you think, why do we, how do we decide people are friends, right? It's not, you can't quantify all of that. You're like, well, there's right. something there. They know something about one another. They're interested in one another's well-being, right? They have points in the past to tether to, right? That's why, however much I may think about myself or you may think about yourself, there's something different that happens when we're together, right? I, I leave feeling different. Why? Because I saw you. Not because I saw someone, right? It would be different if it were someone who's not you, right? That's, that's because we have a real human relationship. Now we call that friendship because that's what the, that's what the language applies to it. But that shouldn't be different in therapy, right? It doesn't mean that these people are friends and they're going out for dinner together. Like it doesn't necessarily have to, it's not that. It's that there's a human connectedness and there's something that's greater than the sum of the parts, Right. So if we look at friendship of, as an aspect of human interconnectedness and and a human ability to see and feel and and um, and be present beyond the self, then that happens in friendships that happens in romance that happens in parent child relationships that happens in a therapy room. And if it's not, then I think there's a problem. I think there is supposed to be something greater than the sum of the parts. Whether we say one plus one should be greater than two, or we say there's an element of friendship in therapy relationships, we can say it any way we want, but it has to be more than just the sum of the parts. That person has to have real regard and interest in the person, have some aspect of the friendliness that friends feel when they're together. The existential therapist understood that, you know, the brand of therapy that, that when it was thought everything is transactional, where you could sit behind the person. Mm. And it's not as if there's nothing that could ever be gained by that, but like that, that can't be the baseline of it. Right. And the, what has happened since then, whether people like Harry Stack Sullivan or, uh, or the, the existential therapist that, that came after Victor Frankl's writing, Rollo May and Irvin Yalom, and they, they were doing something different. They're like, we're humans being with other humans. That's real. And I think that that is I think that that is wonderful. And when I learned that in, in my therapy training, when that element was added, like, oh, it's okay to be human because I had an existential therapist who was taking care of me at the time. And I also had some mentors who were, I thought, oh, okay. You know, we, we have to think about the other person. The session is about the other person, but we're both humans and mm -hmm. it's going to help them if they see that in me too. Every now and then it makes sense to disclose something, right? To, to talk a little bit about yourself in the service of the other, to let the person know something, to let them know that you are not perfect. I mean, I think a reason you and I are able to help people is I don't think either one of us tries to put out there you know, that we are not either now, recently, or potentially suffering through anything someone else out there is suffering through. And I think there's a humanness to that that's just real and honest. And by the way, it doesn't feel better I think to hide behind it, like to, to pretend people can always hide behind something, whether it's socioeconomic or it's a power differential, it's a position in life, or, but that doesn't make anyone feel any better. Like the truth of it is, for example, we do share humanness with everyone. Like we like anyone can get trampled by the society around us. Like lightning can strike us. We all suffer. You know, we all have struggles within us. So, so acknowledging that like we're all human and we're trying to help one another, but we're coming at it from a place of acknowledging what's going on inside of us and that we are not perfect. That's why therapists learn from their patients. Good therapists learn from their patients. Absolutely. I can think of the life lessons mm. that come. Why? Because I'm human too. And I don't have all the answers. Hopefully I have some education and training that can let me help you, but also helping you will help me too. That's true. I think about, you know, I was talking to one of my colleagues before this podcast about trying to organize around a few different phenotypes of people that we interact with um, mm -hmm. in our practice, who, again, um, each of these examples, which are caricatures, of course, um, are people who think everything is fine, 
with respect to their mental health, but there's an externality. Um, so, so kind of like phenotype one is the workaholic. We've talked a lot about mm -hmm. this person. This mm -hmm. is the extreme achiever. This person is so successful on the outside that you, yeah, everybody just assumes, you know, everything is wonderful. But, you know, a lot of times, frankly, when you go from the street to the porch, you realize maybe that's not entirely true. And once you step in the house, you realize that's not entirely true. Um, an, another phenotype would be kind of the, another one we've also spoken about is the, 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 op, you know, the endless optimizer, right? So mm -hmm. incredibly rigid and controlling of everything in order to drive towards, you know, perfect health as an example. Mm -hmm. Um, then you have kind of the, the very anxious person who really struggles with the, the fear of the future. Mm -hmm. Um, and the fear of the future can be short term and it can be long term, but it can be, uh, and again, we, we should have some fear of the future that would, you know, allow us to, you know, do things that are productive, but, but obviously I'm talking about this in a, in a negative way. Um, and, and then kind of like, perhaps at least for me, the most difficult phenotype is the denier, mm -hmm. right? So this is a person who by, by, by any reasonable metric is suffering but their, their barriers to accepting that are so high that y you know, right. you, you could almost see, you could almost make a cartoon about it where you see a person who's missing an arm and you ask right. them if you can help them because they can't do something that would require two right. arms. And they look at you like, what are you talking about? Right. Of course I can do this thing. I have two arms. Well, but you're missing an arm right there. You know, so, um, so, how do you, how do you think about someone, be it a friend, be it a physician, be it anybody trying to, to help and get through to any of these phenotypes right. to, to kind of put the thin end of the wedge, the thin edge of the thin edge of the wedge in there such that they can at least make a tangible step towards self-help. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I think the, the first thing to do is recognize, okay, that there's a problem, right? And then you go back down this idea that there are these cupboards in the conscious mind and the unconscious mind, and they're, they're, that if we go and look and scrutinize what is going on inside of us, or, what, or we have curiosity about what is going on inside of someone else, that we're going to find the answer, that, that this is not a mystery, that just like a Sherlock Holmes investigative process or a math problem, right, one can look at it and, and learn things. So think about the first example, a workaholic. Again, you didn't say someone who works really hard and achieves high, but a workaholic. So even the, the word, by definition, is a problem. Right? So what are workaholics doing? Well, oftentimes they're avoiding something like they're, that's why alcoholics are trying to avoid something by drinking to get away from it. Like we understand that, but it's no less true with workaholic, right? There's something going on inside that person mm -hmm. that they're afraid of, that they're suffering from, that they're ashamed of, like something is driving this behavior. So, so I think, what are you avoiding? What are you trying to get away from? Because workaholic doesn't mean you work very hard and you achieve at a high level. Workaholic means you're working when it makes absolutely no sense to work. So what are you escaping from? So, so then I think there's a defense here that is usually avoidance as a defense. And there's other defenses that come along with it. You know, the person can put kind of blinders on themselves, go in one direction, feel that that's good enough, but boy, aren't they seeing what's on the other side of it or feeling what they would feel on the other side of it. So then that becomes a point of curiosity. Like, is there avoidance? What is that avoidance? What's going on inside that person? Then you think, okay, with someone who's optimizing, always trying to perfect, no, there's there's something different going on there, which is probably more rationalizing, right? Like things, you know, we all kind of know that things get to a place that's good enough. Everyone kind of knows that. So if the person is still trying to make something that's really solidly good enough, perfect, what's going on there? Like what, what are they what are they serving inside of themselves? They're going to soothe something. Some anxiety then gets soothed because they do something that's irrelevant. Like that's not, so let's go look at like why, why that, why the need to focus on optimizing something that's already good enough. There's other things to do in life, right? There's other ways to spend that time and energy. Why that focus? So, you know, it's a process of curiosity when, when people are very, very anxious, then 
that where that leads us is what's going on inside of them. The, 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 they may be, you know, with the younger people in my practice call it future tripping, right? Or, yep. you know, anticipatory anxiety. So is there a way that that person's fear about the future shuts them down, right? So that they're not doing anything in the present and they don't have to be afraid that what they'll do won't work in the future. Like that doesn't go well, right? But but we mm. get into those places. So w- what is that anxiety inside? What is it about? Why is it so high? So then again, we become curious about that. I think you, you, I think you, you called denial is the hardest one. And we think of maladaptive defenses, because how do you get someone around maladaptive defenses? You're trying to help them understand, right? So if you're rationalizing, there's a little bit of a, you know, place we can grab onto that, right? Like, okay, you're rationalizing. Some of it makes sense, then it doesn't, right? But denial can be very, very cut and dry and very frustrating to come up against. And um, I don't know if you met uh, Peter Grover, who's a a therapist within our practice, who's very, very experienced. Peter has a sign on his wall that says, how's that working for you? Right. Because that's his mantra. Like that's he's very, very good at helping people who are in that so difficult denial position by helping them look. Well, let's just look at like, how's it working for you? Right? Let's just so because the idea is then the person's at odds with the therapist. Right. So if you're like, how's that working for you? You can then together look out at it. Right. Where Leston Havens, who I got to meet many years ago, who who in an era when most therapists were sitting behind the patient would sit next to them and look out at the world together. Mm. Right. So so you're trying to do that. So the how's that working for you is like, OK, I hear what you're saying. It's not saying it's right or wrong, like whether you're working or you're doing this. You're Let's just look at how it's working for you. Right. And then you can sometimes but that, get people. that can't really be even answered without some introspective capacity. Right. Because I've 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 interacted with people where maybe I didn't ask that question point blank, but. I can almost imagine that if, if asked, they would respond, great, everything's great. Like, can't you see everything is great. And you're sort of like, right. You know, how do you, I, I I totally understand that of the four phenotypes described, that one is hands down the most difficult. I'm just wondering if the people around individuals like that, if they care about them and they want to help, how can they help them probe even further? Mm -hmm. What, you know, I mean, again, you, 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 you know, you hear the term intervention, Right. Mm-hmm. A person need, at this point, you just get everybody in the room who knows them and you just right. have that 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 right. that, you know, riveting intervention. Uh, what are the what's the equivalent of that state here? It's hard. You know, sometimes you can come at it because you, the idea here is you, the person is not letting you see with them. Right. So you're so you're across from them metaphorically. Mm-hmm. Right. So what you can do is then to tell them to say to them what how you see it. Yeah. Right. Because I just, I can't impact you. You're not letting me, mm-hmm. right. You're, you're bad. There's nothing wrong. That's your story. You're sticking to it. Right. But presumably if, if one is having that conversation with a person, again, there's more, one plus one is equaling more than two. That's why you're sitting across from them. Like there's some emotional investment. There's some respect. There, there's some love or consideration. There's something there that when you say, Hey, I just, I understand that. And I hear where you're coming from and I hear it loud and clear, but I just, want to say to you that from, from where I sit, as someone who knows you, cares about you, loves you, whatever it may be, what I see doesn't seem okay to me. And I just want to say this, I'm trying to force it on you. Like it's just, because people sometimes will remember that down the road. Sometimes like, look, I can't help this person right now. But what I think I can do is maybe put a seed in there that, that may come about later. Like sometimes I'll see this with someone who's say drinking very heavily and, and not acknowledging, I still feel good. I'm not, you know, I don't feel any different. So nothing is going to happen. Now we may have a set of underlying labs that, that we can look back from and we see where those numbers are trending. Right. So it's not hard from the outside to see, but the person is like, I don't feel any different. There's nothing wrong. Right. So even then sometimes, you know, I, I, well, if I can, I'll try and put in an idea of, look, at some point you're going to start feeling something different. Right. At that point, remember this. Mm. Right? Cause the thought is we're acknowledging like you can't get through to everybody and like, that's okay. Right. Mm. If you can't don't keep trying. Cause like, look, I want to tell you how this is going to be bad for you. That th- that person has long turned you off and you, you, you tuned you out and you can't get anywhere with them. But if you do them, it's okay. I, I get it. I'm not, I'm not the person who, who like says you stop drinking or so that's not me. That's not what I'm doing. Right. What I can do is 
maybe plant a seed that I think you're going to start feeling something at some point in time. This is going to start feeling different. Remember this then. And, you know, sometimes people do, sometimes they don't. But a lot of times when people get help, you do see that they've taken that inside from sometimes from someone else. Sometimes I'll see it in my own work where someone who I thought things ended very badly and, and the person wasn't helped and they left and I tried to plant a seed and then they come back in a couple of years. You know, I thought about that and like, wow, that, that feels great because it tells you you're doing, it's a proof of concept that you're doing the right thing by planting these seeds. But more often than not, we see someone else has planted the seed. Maybe that was another therapist or was another friend or someone else said that or someone said it a long time ago, they read it in a book. You know, the idea is like if we can plant seeds in people who are in denial, those seeds may grow. But we have to understand when we can't do more than that and stop. Otherwise, you know, we could drive the person away and prevent any help from coming. Does that, does that make sense? One final question I just want to want to ask you, Paul, is about um, how you manage internally the the challenges of what you do in the sense that you know you 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 work with all sorts of people across all sorts of spectrums and obviously we didn't talk about it today because we've spoken about it a lot in the past but <clears throat> but you you know you're going to be very quick to look for the trauma in a person's life mm -hmm that probably shaped many of the adaptations that exist today. And in doing so, sometimes those things are very sad and they're very tragic. And um, I, I just wonder how you, you, you manage the sadness around that for yourself. Um, mm -hmm. I, I think about what it was like being a resident, right? You know, you patients would come in and they would die, you know, trauma victims, right. someone gets in, a, someone comes in in a car accident and they're dead, uh, or you take care of them and, but you can't save them. And those things right. are, we don't, we don't really get taught how to manage that right. at all. Right. I, I found that to be hands down the biggest failure of our, of our training system. Perhaps that's changed, mm -hmm. but, but certainly when I went through um, there was absolutely no discussion even of that. I remember being reprimanded for going to the funeral of, mm -hmm. of, a, of a patient. Um, be, be the idea being like, you, that's a line you never cross. Mm -hmm. And um, you, you, know, you have to block that stuff out, basically. Yeah. Um, so how, how do you deal with that? Well, I'd start by saying I agree with you. I think at least in our era of training... Uh, medicine did a lamentable job of that. And and if you think about medicine, hopefully selecting for empathic people or compassionate people. And when a person is built that way, that one plus one is more than one. So you feel part of a we, if you're taking care of someone and they die, you're not that person, but, but magically it's what goes on in our heads. We feel sort of part of them because we're a we, we see that with people we really love who are close to us, like they're part of who sure. we are. But we, we see this in settings where we're, we're helping people too. And, and I don't know if you went through this part of it. I remember when you were talking, I remember very vividly being an intern and having to really tell myself, like, I am not this person, right? Because they start feeling like, oh my gosh, I could see this person is suffering. And, this, and, and like, it's easy to lose those boundaries. So to be able to say, like, like I'm standing, I'm here, that person is there. The, in fact, the only way I'm going to be able to help them is I have to know that I am not that person, but it wasn't easy. And I remember one of my... Uh, co-interns. I remember he and I really talking about that and we were trying to do it for, for one another. Like, okay, like you calm down a little bit. Like you're, you're not this person. Let's, let's step back from it, catch our breath and try and help the person. He probably remembers we did it for one another. And I think it, it, for me, it starts with that because that's a physical separation. Mm. Right. And then the idea that I can mentalize a lot, meaning like think a lot and feel things we can all do this but like you do this when you're a therapist you're feeling what other people are feeling you're feeling for them it's easy to keep that in your mind too much mm -hmm. then just like if we picked a word and said it five thousand times it'll be in us tomorrow right if there's something you don't want to do and you repeat it 20 times you're more likely to do it again right the same is true when we have when we can't bound ourselves well enough from the suffering in other people this is why people have post-trauma syndromes from vicarious trauma Hmm. Right? I mean, this absolutely happens. The brain is changed. There are biological changes, behavioral changes, and all of that trauma is vicarious. And this is why we see 
the levels of depression and suicidality and substance use is higher in people who are giving care to others. Yeah. So, so it is so important that we have these boundaries inside of us and they have to come, I think, from this place of balanced drives and gratitude and humility. I'm so grateful I get to know other people. They share things with me. I can help them. I can learn from them. That is such a wonderful thing that it helps me to hand to, to accept the other side of it, which is sometimes things that are very, very hard to hear or very hard to get out of our minds. And I have to have the humility that I am human too. And if I keep this in my head, or if I'm really mad about this thing, this thing that happened to somebody, see, we, you know, we see the, the most awful things people can do to one another that, you know, I know these things happen. I, I can fester on the anger, the frustration, the misery of this, and I will hurt myself. So my obligation to myself and to the people around me that I care about in the world, the people I love or people I, 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 I know and I like them. Like I, I want to be healthy. I want to be at my best and I have to be able to maintain these boundaries inside of me, which means have the discipline to stop thinking about that. Right? Know that, take stock of, I'm doing the best I can for that person. I'm still worried. This is not, I'm worried this is not going to have a good outcome. Like, am I, am I doing what I can do? I can. Okay, I must there must be something else that comes into my mind. And I, and, and I, I find it, it is easier to do that as I focus more on the balance of drives. I'm being generative. I'm asserting myself. I'm taking pleasure in what I'm doing. And I feel gratitude for what I'm doing and the humility to know that if I don't take care of myself, you know, it'll kill me too. Paul, I want to thank you again for, um, so for, for not making, not just making the trip out, but more importantly, of course, sharing all of these insights in a, in a manner that's, that's incredibly lucid and helpful. Thank um, you. I, I look forward to doing this again, cause obviously we will. I do too. I do too. Thank you so much for having me. It's wonderful to see you. And, and I so appreciate being on the podcast. Thank you. Thank you.